Hi everyone, maybe we can say hi to start with. Hello everyone, okay, great. So sorry, we had like some technical difficulties uh, joining, but uh, hopefully, you know, this like online stuff is always challenging, but we're gonna try our best to, um, you know, deliver the deliver the content and create some interesting things today. I think this is this is a very hot topic. So what you wanted to do is a uh, couple of things. Actually, this is an ambitious workshop, but it's an easy one because we have all the material ready uh, in the Google Drive that I sent yesterday night. And what we're going to do is we will update as we move forward. We will collect your files and we will include them too. So this is going to be a fully collaborative, you know, six hours if we can pull it. And at the end of the day, you're going to have the material that you can use for next 10 days to three months, four months. Okay, so that's the that's the idea. And I think the big discussion now is, uh, you know, of course, generating uh, images by using AI. Uh, and the, the the subject is, you know, a lot of people are super interested in the, the opportunity, right? Some people are more critical. Some people are kind of like hesitant to jump in. Some are in it and investing a lot and so on and so forth. So uh, I think the years that I mentioned is important. When you go back 15 to 20 years ago, I think my personal uh, observation is this is very similar to the time when, you know, uh, parametric modeling started picking up. Picking up in terms of it was becoming really commonplace, right? So we were doing parametric generative design, free grasshopper uh, by coding, scripting, and so on. And then came generative components, which is developed by Bentley Systems. And then they came, they, then came, uh, you know, Grasshopper, and everybody was kind of like, you know, uh, saying that okay, this is the future, and you know, we're never going back, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I think uh, people ended created ending and ended up creating a lot of like uh, experiments, experiments, right? So the question is, how do you know if an experiment is a good or bad? Like if you look back, if you Google now, there's a lot of like interesting projects from that era, which became some books, right? And there's also lots of, you know, like noise. And I think the same is happening with AI now. So what we will try to do today is actually it's a it's a, a creative journey, right? So this is this is not going to give you engineering solutions, but it will, uh, you know, uh, I think equip you with the skills that you can first use AI stable diffusion to generate images in different platforms. So we're going to show how to do this in Photoshop how to run it locally on your machine if you have a, you know, NVIDIA GPU. And we will also show, you know, hopefully Diego will join us in the afternoon. And we will also show, you know, how to use Colab, which is, uh, you know, it just, just the web interface that you can run and machine learning and AI models. So that's one. Uh, and the second thing is we also wanted to not leave this, at, leave it at, at that point, because you probably have already, you know, like some generative design, parametric design skills. And the question is, how can you take this and, you know, generate some forms? I think the journey of going from image to image to image is something that we always do. You start with a sketch, which is an image, you make a 3D model, which is an image on the screen, you render it, which is another image, you know, and then you take the render and, you know, use it, let's say, a map or something else, texture map, right? So, which is another image. So, what we're going to do today is ex exact. I mean, something similar. So, we're gonna we're gonna take uh, make images that are related to data. You don't have to, but we did a lot for them already. If you want to explore them too, you can explore in the Google Drive. But you can create your own, and then we will show how you can use different methods to kind of use cre apply creative techniques to make three D forms in Rhino. So that can also let, lead to, you know, like renderings, animations, data stories, data visualization, and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's the point. So without further ado, let me show you. I'm going to show you first a two-minute video and then four minutes of the video and then maybe three, four minutes again just to put everything into context. So let me share my screen for that. Uh, let's say optimize for... Where's the sound? Okay. Share screen. And share the sound. Optimize for video. There we go. All right. 
So I hope you can see the screen now. Let me see if I can see you again. So I'm gonna just go ahead and play this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there for a second. Uh, quick question, Sophie. I, am I the host now? Because when I open the video, I cannot see anybody on the, on the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am the host. Okay. Yeah. So I need to change something here. But anyway, I'll deal with it. You, I hope you saw the video and you were able to hear the sound. Okay, great. So if you see that there's an image on the right side, so let me keep playing that uh, as I talk over, speak over that, so share the screen. Unfortunately, I can't see anyone when I'm doing this, so I just muted it. What's happening is, yeah, this is totally, every mesh here, you see 3D mesh here is generated by the image that you're using uh, that's being kind of like displayed on the right side. Okay, so this is something that I did I think three years ago uh, or more, uh, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the story of that. So all these videos are, by the way, in this you know like my my YouTube channel, so you can kind of like go and check those if you want to see them. Okay, so the next one is let me stop this for a second again. Okay, so here is the story. This is the context for you. And copying is very important because copying help us build styles. So these are some, you know, oil paintings that I uh, that I work on. And for me, it's always a, you know, uh, let's say, a, a challenge to generate this kind of, let's say, ambiguous, let's say, textures and colors and so on by by computers because everything you you make kind of like ends up being somehow flat. So I had this question, okay, if I, like, how can I replicate the style, you know, that I'm having on the oil painting side? So as I was painting, I was taking the photographs of the paintings and you would see that, you know, there is, there's some sort of a language. It's not 100% there yet. They're, they're not really matching 100%, but there's a recurring this, you know, technique that I'm using with the, with the uh, knife, a uh, painting knife. And uh, it's helping me build this, let's say, style. But what it really is, is not that clear. So what I did is I collected these, I put these images together, and then I fed them into a machine learning algorithm. And this was the outcome. So what we see here is they are really reminiscent of the paintings that I did, right? We see paintings, we, we see colors. They are somehow merging and blending, and they are more streamlined than uh, you know, the paintings themselves. But at the same time, it's an extension of my work, right? So I don't evaluate these on the same level with my paintings, but they're helping me expand my understanding uh, to the next level. And what do I do with these images? So first I analyze them, I look at them, and interestingly, sometimes you see some outcomes. Oh, wh where is this thing coming from, right? So there's like a circular object there. And it turns out that, you know, within the collection, I, I had one single image with, which had these speckles, right? So it's interesting that when you're working with machine learning, you know, the outcome, you can guess what's gonna come out, but there are always surprises, right? So I like that surprise part. 
And this kind of taught me that, okay, the data set is really important. And even if you have, let's say one single, you know, painting that has these weird features, they may appear back in the painting this way, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a good learning process. And then the other thing is, everything comes, let's say, washed out from this process. So you have to go back to it and sharpen it and so on and so forth. So what I'm doing is uh, here is I started with oil paintings. I took the photographs, I ran a machine learning algorithm and it helped me produce these interesting images. And then I ended up making clouds, right? So I was like, okay, where is this coming from? So this is like exactly using, let's say an image like that, right? So I'm using this and I'm transforming into, let's say uh, a, a meshing algorithm this time uh, and you know bitmap processing uh, then this thing emerges so this is very inspiring for me because it doesn't also end there i can still move on to the next step but in a way this is very similar to looking at the clouds and finding shapes in them right so i'm doing vice versa i'm taking looking at the shapes and making clouds out of them so uh this is again you know being on the move this is again moving from one idea to the other one because uh, by using these images, I ended up making these, uh, these forms. So they are very kind of architectural, right? And I was very surprised to see that in myself because I was coming from, you know, end of architecture, product design, oil painting, and then suddenly something architectural really emerged out of these uh, by using. Okay, so that is, the, that is the short story. And I think it's kind of like giving this, you know, like context uh, for, the, uh, for the study. What is interesting is once when that was this was done more than three years ago, uh, there were no text to image based tools, right? So this was like just using style GANs, uh, S GANs to you know train a machine learning model, create latent spaces of images, and you know get like a variety of uh, images so you can kind of like process that. So my question then was, okay, you know you can train models, but what do you do with the you know, abundant uh, number of images that you create. Uh, and here actually, now you can make even more by using uh, text to uh, image tools. So, okay, with that, you know, I will stop here. Uh, and again, if you're interested, you know, go to just Google, actually, if you go YouTube slash computational design, that's me, YouTube slash at computational design. So you're gonna find it or the, the name of the, you know, all these videos are here, design computation here. So this is the page. Okay, so if you go there, you're gonna see uh, all the, you know, whatever, like takes the image AI or, you know, generative design uh, things, including the video that I showed you. With that, I'm gonna hand it to Dana uh, and she's gonna do the real stuff, right? So I'm kind of like, I'm just talking. She's going to show you how you can first uh, start running stable diffusion in Photoshop if you have it installed. Just hearing about your background, I think all of you probably have Photoshop installed already. Uh, and if not, we will also show uh, how to run uh, stable diffusion locally. That's that's a hard installation. So for that one, we're going to play a video. And if you have already downloaded the files we sent, you're going to have kind of like easy time uh, doing that. So Dana, thank you. Great. Thanks, Onar. Um, so first, I'm going to dive right into the, the Photoshop plugin for stable diffusion that we've been using. Um, let me share my screen. So I, it doesn't look like I have access to screen sharing. Let me see, I, I can do that really fast here. Mm, yeah, I'll make you a host. So yes, okay. you should be able to share now. Okay, great. And then I do, Okay. Can anyone see my screen, the Google Drive directory here? Okay. So um, I'm going to run through this live quickly, but in the folder, Stable Diffusion Installation, you can go to um, this first video dated 1031 and it will replay what I'll go through live here in case you miss any of it. So first, um, if you Google a Photoshop stable diffusion, it should come up, but I'll start with the author of the plugin, his page, Christian Cantrell. Um, we like to install it directly through Adobe Exchange. So if I click that link, 
um, it'll take you to this and you'll be able to acquire uh, this plugin right here. It should say free with the blue button if you don't already have it installed. So mine's already installed. So you want to click that blue button in the upper right. You also need to create a Dream Studio account. So you will copy and paste this URL into a new window. And that, I'll bring up my account. So while you're doing that, um, maybe I'll give, give a couple of minutes, but essentially this is creating an API key um, after you create your account and you'll we'll copy and paste this into Photoshop. Um, so I have the Creative Cloud Desktop app and when I go to that, um, under Stock and Marketplace, Plugins, Manage Plugins, after you've accessed it, it should pop up here. And this is where you'll install it into Photoshop. So just a reminder, you'll want Photoshop closed during this whole process. So you'll want to click Install. And uh, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so soon. Um, but when I try to install it, it says that my Photoshop is not compatible. Mm. Do you know what that could be? I'm if wondering my... if you have an older version of Photoshop. Um, um, 2021, it's not that old. I think yeah, I so, have... yeah. What, what happens is, you know, when you have the uh, Creative Cloud running in the background, you get these uh, frequent uh, upgrades. So even if mm -hmm. like, you know, it's nine, nine months old, it may not be compatible with the AI tools. So they've been releasing these neural filters and new AI tools in Photoshop. So if you open um, Creative Cloud Desktop app uh, on the computer, yeah. you will see if you have an update for Photoshop. So let's check that. If that's not it, let's get back to it again. Yeah, let me have a look. Yeah, so it might take a bit to update Photoshop and then um, install the plugin. But while everyone is getting up to speed on that, I can show you what it looks like. Um, so after you install the plugin through Creative Cloud, you can open Photoshop. Um, and I usually do a new file. And then under the plugins menu, you should see all of the plugins you have installed. It should say Stable Diffusion. And this toggles the window um, like other Photoshop windows, and they'll just pop up. And so this is where you'll enter the API key from Dream Studio. So you'll copy paste that into this box. Again. Could you jump to that page again, Dana? So there are two things going, right? So one is the uh, Photoshop plugin page, which is the official Adobe website, right? The other one is the Dream Studio account, which is a separate thing. So you have to open it on your own and it gives you three, two bucks to use, two dollars to use, right? So then you have to kind of like bridge these two things, making Photoshop use the account here by using the API key. A key. Sorry, thank you, Dana. Sure, yes. So I copy paste this into Photoshop and then you should be good to go. So generate um, is where you're going to enter the text prompts. And um, this is a good link for uh, basics of prompt engineering. So it's, you know, as I've gone through some of these um, text to image exercises myself, I realized that like it, it definitely is a craft and, and um, you'll, you know, your process will change as the more you use these tools. So I recommend this article for sure. And um, there's a number of parameters that I'll leave, I'll leave it up to you to experiment with them, um, but you're able to, you know, you can put in any text. The one example I, I did use was on the video city skyline and then I like to add styles like artistic styles um so I'm just going to add and I'll also add reference an artist and um sometimes 
you know, depending on who your favorite artist is, it the the data set, the tree not necessarily recognize your artist, so you you'll be able to see the results and see if. Um, Dana, j just a quick note. I think you're fur further away from the mic, so when you type, oh, you're yeah. kind of like not hearing you well. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Yes. Let me move my computer slightly. But I'm going to put in um, Mark Bradford. He's one of my favorite artists. Mark Bradford artist. And then number of images. I'll bump that up, and I'll do a smaller image size just in this for the sake of time and then click dream and it's it's nice that it's built in here um so it generated four images with my prompt and you're able to you know create layers in your current document with these images and there are a number of things you can do you know save check check the parameters and the prompt strength will change uh, based on what you input. So how's everybody doing with the Photoshop updates? Yeah, just let's, let's pause here for a second and see if anybody got this installed or if anybody knew about it before. Do you have stable diffusion in Photoshop? Um, it might be just me, but I don't have Photoshop installed, so that'll be the first step for me. Um, so do we need Photoshop for the rest of the workshop? No. Or is it just this part? No. So what's okay. going to happen is we're going to show a couple of methods for you to install. And as we yeah. said, so this, this is being recorded already, so this for mm -hmm. future reference. But we also have these installation uh, methods recorded for you in the Google Drive, right? And for the ones who are unable to generate images today, we actually put, I don't know how many, but more than two, 300 photo images already, which are generated. So you will have some time to explore those, I think in seven, eight different folders, and then you can pick some images to work with, right? So it's, it's totally open. Okay, awesome, thank you. By the way, uh, so the things that we haven't mentioned is, okay, we're using stable diffusion, but you may have a mid journey account. Anybody with mid journey account here? One, I need to hear you, I guess, because I, I can't see. You can't type me, but okay, let's use chat. If you have a uh, mid journey, say I do in the chat. Okay, let's see that. I have mid as one, two, three. Great. Okay. So if you have mid journey four, <laughs> That's good. If you meet journey, that's wonderful. Just me, use mid journey, right? So there, there are kind of like no, no rules, no sharp rules about it. Uh, run out of credits. Okay. I'm going to send you $2 now mm -hmm. or if to, to get it going. So uh, you can use mid journey. Dolly, Dolly too, anyone? Okay. There's one person I'm seeing. So I did the same thing. I have, you know, you can just type and I can see it. So there's at least one person. Uh, so the only difference is, again, we are going to show the uh, what we show after this one, uh, running stable diffusion locally on your computer is totally free. You can generate infinite amount of images for free. So that's, it's a large file because you need to download the dependencies, trained models, right? So you have to have that like four gigabyte file on your computer. But that's the next thing we're going to look into. Photoshop is kind of like handy for the reasons, you know, if you want to edit something really fast, uh, that's why uh, it is really good. Maybe we can go over the parameters quickly, Dana, because we're going to have the similar parameters in on the uh, local version as well. Sure. Uh, so let's go over those really fast. Okay. So this, this process is, Dana, if I can jump in for a second. So yeah. Diffusion is this. So it starts with a, it starts with an ambiguous, uh, hazy image. It starts with noise, and then it tries to reduce, you know, the noise and tries to find the figure within the noise. That's the this, this the diffusion process, right? Uh, you know, technically, uh, this like text to image based. Uh, all like tools are working this way. It it randomizes pixels and then it tries to kind of like use a pre-trained machine learning model. 
to, to make an object that looks like what you're asking for, like a car, like a cityscape, and so on and so forth. So even if you're using Midjourney, for instance, you can see the diffusion process. If you use dash dash video command in um, Midjourney, it's gonna show you how the image is starting with the noise, and then it's kind of like clearing over time. So it's almost like noise, super crazy noise reduction. Okay, so keep that in mind. So in regard to that, if you see the steps slider, that's exactly what that is, okay? So that is how much you want the diffusion process to go for, right? So 50, 50, 60, you know, average numbers. If you bump it, it's going to, uh, you know, reduce the noise more and more trying to get to closer to what you're trying to do, okay? What trying to get in your prompt. So it's going to use more dollars if you are using, you know, like a paid subscription. On the mid-journey side, that will be a quality parameter. You know, if you use quality one, quality two is the default. If you go to, uh, sorry, quality one is the default. If you go 1.525, you know, it's gonna cost more GPU time for you. Uh, and yeah, the prompt strength is just, you know, like how much, if you give a seed image, you can start with an image and then, you know, make the uh, tool work on it. You can change the weights. And then number of, of images is just like what, what it is. So that's pretty much that. Uh, Dana, maybe we can show, click the un include image and show the options that, that you can uh, show images. Yeah. 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 So I think, yeah, this is referencing, I think document content is what you currently have open. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, selected layer, self-explanatory. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it kind of describes each. So yeah, you can you can do like in paint thing, you know, select an area and it's going to do the in paint thing, which I'm not going to go into now. Uh, you can see what it is. And then selected layer means you can literally drop a cityscape in this, uh, let's say, Photoshop file, let's say Chicago skyline or New York, whatever. And then, you know, you can use the same prompt and then it's going to use the, the base image to, you know, kind of like use stable diffusion process the diffusion process all by using that image. So that's pretty much that. So- Yeah. And just to add, you can influence the strength of, of the image you're referencing down here. So how much will it stay close closer to that input image or further away from that? So if you, we are gonna, we are gonna have a break, right? So we, again, we have the video. Uh, if you have installed this already, if you have it, you can play with it. You can come back and ask us, uh, you know, if you want to kind of like, or we can just kind of like play with it together, right? So you don't have to ask a question. Uh, uh, but let us show the second, you know, the local installation over a video. So again, as I said, we will show this. Some of you can get it done. So it will give you infinite power of, you know, exploring, like having it, you know, like a unlimited time on mid journey. Uh, but if you can get it installed, you know, today, again, maybe during the break, uh, we can use it together. With that, again, like I'm going to give it, you know, hand it back to Dana. Sure. Um, if somebody could just shout out, if you can't hear the sound, I apologize if the quality isn't great, but I'll play it. So we're going to install Stable Diffusion locally. Yes, we can. Should have received a folder to download to your desktop. Um, this one is called SD Local, and I don't have everything included in here because I'm going to go through exactly how to get this up and running. So we will want to install Python first, the latest version, 3.10. Double click, click Run. I already have it installed. Unless you have it installed, you should see this um, setup box. What you should see is install um, as the only option and then two check boxes at the bottom here. You want to check both of those. Make sure add Python 310 to path is checked. So I'm gonna... did everyone get that? Make sure you have these two boxes at the bottom of the install checked. It's not shown on my screen. Yeah, if you downloaded the files from, uh, you know, Google Drive, just start installing it now. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, you have to have an NVIDIA GPU on your computer, by the way, for this one. So if you have like, you know, if you don't have that uh, kind of PC, 
I mean, I, I wouldn't spend too much time with this one. Cancel out of here, but you should install, go ahead and follow the prompts and install Python 3.10. Next, we will install Git, double click, and just for purposes of example, I'm going to add my credentials. And I already have it installed, but just so you know, as I go through, we want everything checked on this components section. And then under default editor, make sure that use notepad as Git's default editor is selected. And then we will click next, nothing else needs to be changed from the defaults and then click install. So unfortunately I'm removing and then reinstalling it. I already have it installed. So this should be relatively quick. And when this is finished, We should be able to just cancel out of here. We don't need the ribbon, so it's finished. Okay, next we're going to make sure we're in this SD local folder uh, in Explorer and type CD enter. And a terminal window will pop up. This is where you can open the text file that's in that folder. There are two um, lines of text here. The first one will copy and paste into that terminal, enter. And it's essentially copying the stable diffusion web UI folder into this directory. So we can now just close out of And then next, you'll see that there's a dependency file. We want to extract, um, extract files. And so this could take a bit, but you'll see, depending on how fast your machine is, it should create this folder with two files in it. Now mine's moving pretty fast, but we may need to pause the video while you extract these. But hopefully this doesn't take too long. And then we will go in here. You'll see there's two files, a checkpoint file and a path. We're going to cut these and add them to under the stable diffusion web UI folder that was just previously downloaded under models stable diffusion and then paste here and then we'll go into the stable diffusion web UI folder and go down to web UI user dot bat and double click this file here. And you'll see it running. This could take anywhere between five to 15 minutes. And so this is installing all of the things required to run stable diffusion um, locally. And so right now I'll just pause this while it finishes installing and then we can pick back up and uh, test it out. Okay, so you'll know when this it's done running when you see running on local URL at the bottom here. So you'll be able to just copy this address and we're going to open a new window 
in Chrome and paste them in. And one second here. So we're going to paste that in, and you should see this. And the video is, is yes, it's at the end. I just go through another example of a, typing in a prompt, but um, this is this is what it should look like when it's successfully installed and you can test it with uh, typing in a prompt into the browser. So was everyone able to, to get the files from Google Drive onto their desktop? I was yeah. not. Um, but uh, owner sent me another link, which I could download. Yeah, so Great. what I what I did is for, for the people who are unable to download that, the two dependencies, which are the some, like almost two of the largest files. So let me send them to you now. Uh, so we can, Oscar emailed me and I sent him the, let me see here, the two links. So the dependency files are, if you want to download them directly, directly I just dropped them in the chat. Uh, so you can download the dependencies and then the GitHub installer and so on and so forth. So you can pick the files that you are downloading from the Google Drive. You don't, you don't have to download everything. And I just asked in the chat if you have an NVIDIA GPU, um, like only one person responded to others. Like, does anybody else have it at all? Not really, no NVIDIA GPUs on the PCs, okay. Okay then, so this, this kind of like shows me that we are gonna use like the local won't be a, you know, like the, the best choice uh, for you, but hopefully let's see if we can find other tools. But in the meantime, uh, let's give, uh, you don't have the dependencies file. Okay, so you can download these two links from these two links, Anastasia. Uh, so these are the dependencies uh, which you are looking for. Okay, it's in the chat again, the links. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is, uh, we're gonna give like five minute break for everybody to either kind of like look into Photoshop, look into um, uh, Stable Diffusion Local, looks like, like, not every, like not many people will use it. But at the same time, start browsing the images here. So I'm just going to send a link, uh, which is if you go to our shared folder, you will see demo files. Under the demo files, you have images uh, folder. So I'm gonna get the link, copy the link again for you. Just put it in the chat. Okay, so the links from the chat are not working. Cool, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is, I will go back to the email I sent yesterday. Uh, sent items, well, this morning, I guess. I'm trying to see where the email was. Okay, so I'm gonna reply all. Uh, did you get that email? Because one email was rejected and I'm wondering if it was the, um, Anastasia, your email, a KPF email. Did you receive it? Did, did all of you receive an email around like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Eastern time? One person didn't receive that email, I think, because I got a warning. But anyway, I'm kind of like putting all these links again and just sending you the, um, Sending you the links. Okay, so I just sent that. Let me share my screen for a second. So if you let's do that. Okay, great. So if I share my screen, host disabled participant screen sharing because I'm not. Can I make myself the host again? Okay, Dana, you need to make me host now. Why are you banning me? Okay, how do I do that? 
Uh, uh, go to go to my video, and then you have three dots uh, on yes. the right side. Say make host. Ah uh, yes, we're gonna have to. Okay. Keep yeah, exactly. Flipping it back and forth. All right. So if we go to here, okay. So if you go uh, to our uh, shared folder, this uh, you have demo files. And if you go to images, so these will have, uh, you know, Rhino and uh, Grasshopper files. By the way, this GH plugins and add-ons try to try to try to install these, uh, you know, at your own earliest convenience. You don't need Monolith. It's a pretty old, you know, uh, let's say um, plugin. You don't need it now, but try to install all all the other ones. But in the meantime, uh, if you want to explore the images, so you can go to he go here. So these were, you know, created in Mid Journey. Uh, most of them, I would say. So they they were created by using um, data prompts, right? So, and this was a funny one because I was doing this, and it's, it's it was just saying like abacus, right? So it was creating these these sort of images. You know, they are kind of like boxy stuff that are you know more abstract, you know, data curtain painted, you know, sort of stuff. Uh, data is like architectural expression. So these were interesting for me because, you know, it, I was trying to get some, uh, you know, tectonic forms uh, and so on and so forth. Any... All right, see you, see you, Annie. See you later, hopefully we're gonna be fine. Dana, we shouldn't close the uh, meeting. You know, that's the thing that we need to remember. Okay. You're not supposed to close. So base images are the images that we're gonna use in the demos. We don't have to, but we're gonna show them. Uh, and, uh, oh, data flux. So this is one, which is interesting because with this one, I'm gonna show an animation. And I think this is the closest thing to the, to the first video that I showed today. So it's like step-by-step, step, you can kind of like process these images and make 3D forms. Uh, what else? Oh, and there's this huge library that, you know, which, which includes uh, Dana's uh, artistic explorations with stable diffusion. These were local, right, Dana? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. So I you like know, it you because it's free too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like another yeah. reason to, to allow that. So you can familiarize yourself with those images, check the installations. I'm just giving, so it's like 11.07. So I'm just giving a seven minute break. And if you have anything installed, if you have Mid Journey or Dolly, explore, like try to make some images, right? So related to data. So uh, we are here, I'm here. I just need to kind of like check a couple of things. For next eight minutes until 11.15 and 11.15, uh, Dana will start with the first uh, Rhino Grasshopper file. Actually one thing, of course, okay, I said 11.15, but you need to install the GH uh, Grasshopper extensions, all of them. Uh, so Dana, maybe let's go over them first, sorry, and then give the break. Could you just kind of like show the extension, uh, the add-ons that we need to install? I just sure, yeah. let's go, go over them again, thanks. Um, can you make me a photo? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes, there you go. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, um, in demo files, um, plugin folder. So, ignore monolith, it's the largest plugin file. You don't need that. Um, this is, yeah, so. Aviary is just for uh, bitmap processing. And I'm sure you all know, but download and copy into the Grasshopper Components folder and make sure the files are unblocked um, for any uh, of these DLL file types. Um, Dendro is similar, you just have to unzip it. And there are some examples of Hedgehog in this folder. So. It's essentially three plugins, Dendro, Hedgehog, and Aviary. And um, once, once you have those, you can open the uh, image to 2D pixel map, Rhino and Grasshopper file. I think there, yeah, there's only one, one file in each folder. And if you open those, it should tell you if you're missing any plugins.
Okay, great. Yeah, while we're at it, let me ask. Um, uh, anybody, do you all have rhino and grasshopper experience? Yes. It, are there any no's here, like no grasshopper at all? No rhino? Because if not, then this workshop probably is, is going to be just kind of like look and see and watch and, you know, but if you have the experience, I think it's it's the right place for you to be at. So that's great. Okay. So Chris, uh, what is the problem with extracting files? It just doesn't work for you. Yeah, it's not an option when I right click on the. On the file. Oh, sure. Weird. Yeah. I wonder if the file is not downloaded fully. Can you try to that that RAR file has the you know, the the two dependencies, which are the two links that I sent you. So maybe okay. you can try to download them separately and follow the installation and then get it done. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, let's use the next 10 minutes, I would say to, to get first grasshopper things, you know, the extensions installed for everyone. Uh, and then uh, we will go with the first demo file Dana has. Dana, could you also show where that is and which file we are opening and which file we will look into? Yes. Your first file, thank you. Yeah, so we will do, let me go back. Uh, so demo files, image to 2D pixel map, you'll open the Rhino and Grasshopper file in these folders. So, so if all, all the, yeah, all the Grasshopper dependencies and plugins are installed correctly, you shouldn't get any warning. If you get a yeah. warning and, you know, Grasshopper. You um, just need to go yeah. back to the yeah. Go go ahead. The Tom. other thing is yeah. The other thing is owner mentioned. I have images linked in those files. So if you go into the images folder and base images, if you download this whole folder and put it with your Rhino Grasshopper files, um, you may need to relink the images, which we can go through. Um, but the the ones I'm using in the example files are in this folder. Yeah, we can definitely relink them so everybody can kind of like see that from the folder. That's great. Yeah, great. So yeah, this is this is a full open 10 minutes, right? So let us know if you need help with installations in the chat or just speaking to us. If you want to play with, you know, stable diffusion mid journey uh, images with prompts, let us know. Uh, Dana, maybe in the meanwhile, as people are installing, you can share the stable diffusion screen, the local. I know you exper you know, experimented a lot. Yeah. And just show us, you know, some like uh, prompts about like style, camera, uh, you know, whatever. So just, sure. just let's let's keep it going. Sure. Um, so let me share again. And I'll just kind of narrate as I go and, and maybe uh, do some tests as well. So let me go back over to here. Here we go. So I'll start with just the text to image. Um, maybe later we could touch on image to image which was similar to the Photoshop plugin when we were referencing an image we had open. Um, so some of the things that I've been experimenting with are like, you know, writing, writing an object. So for some of the like artistic ones that I did, I would start with like, um, owner gave me this tip, data painted on building. And then I would, I, I put some like random qual like image qualities, which I think offer some unexpected results. So like, sometimes I would do like light and shadow or contrast or high red. Um, and these can be as long as you want you want them to be. And then I would reference artistic styles. Um, you might be able to pick out some 
I did Zaha. And yeah, architects or artists are always nice, um, especially if you can recognize their style. You can start to make connections with how the strength of, of where that prompt is in the string. Um, I noticed that the the pro the words at the end of the prompt maybe I don't know if this is true but maybe have less strength than the beginning um, depending on how many words you you input. Um, so let's just generate. I also like to do more than one because then you can compare um, between multiple images, the differences, and start to make connections with um, how you're, you know, affecting these, these parameters. So, so this percentage is showing Dana's GPU running reading the information from the pre-trained AI model, machine learning model that is using the stable diffusion algorithm. So that's why it's free, right? So there's no service provider, it's not on the cloud, it's just like locally happening, uh, which is an you know, open source uh, code people shared, which is great. Yeah, so it's interesting because I gravitate towards like the non-realistic <laughs> images. So I think, you know, you can affect that by putting in artistic styles. You could put realistic as a prompt if you want to generate hyper real or even hyper real. Um, but I, I really like, you know, and so I like oil painting. Um, but let's see. One of the other things that I did do, like just in keeping with the architecture theme, I I like to also put in, like you can put in vantage points, like top view, elevation, um, topography, or like if you wanna generate like a map uh, infographic or map image, um, all these descriptors will affect uh, the final result. So I really like just changing, you know, one or two of the words and, and then you'll like build this database of how it's working. Um, and you could really start to refine what your images are. You could also put in like different color schemes. So if you write, you know, words, different colors, like, you know, black or, you know, backlit even, it'll start to change the lighting. Yeah, could you do that, Francis Dana? Could you could you make like uh, yeah backlights and then also uh, depth of field maybe or focal depth or bokeh? Yeah. So these are kind of like you can you can literally put camera. So you can you can say architectural visual a portrait you know taken by using thirty five millimeter lens, right? So. I think what is really interesting here is that your experience and your knowledge about like uh, visual arts and photography comes into play here and rendering. So if you say, you know, octane render, for instance, it knows what an octane lighting looks like, right? So the, uh, or I mean, it knows meaning it's, it's implemented in that, right? So uh, they use that, that kind of data set. Yeah, so I, I added watercolor in here, which starts to uh, get a little more interesting to me and unexpected. Um, so. yeah, that's probably, you know, like the depth of field and watercolor are working against each other here, right? Because yeah. the watercolor is trying to make things abstract and the uh, depth of field is trying to make it photographic. So that's the, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. We talked about the, you know, I talked about the diffusion process and the steps in Photoshop, if you remember. We are showing this because a new version of this is 
available free again, and you can run it. If you have a Google account, you can just run it, right? So we're gonna show that in the afternoon when Diego joins too. So don't say, you know, like, okay, this is local, I can't install it. No, actually you can install it with this in Colab. Uh, you know, he just got to me like now, uh, uh, 30 minutes ago. So you're gonna show that. Uh, so it's important to understand what's happening here. The sampling steps here is exactly that diffusion process. So could you drag that slider from 20 to 60, Dana? So we're gonna let the diffusion process go three times more, right? So it's gonna take way more time. And Dana's GPU get warmer, will get warmer, you know, because it's gonna be used more. And you're gonna see that the progress is much slower now, right? So it was going like 10, 20, 30%, and now it's going quite two, four, six, and so on and so forth. But essentially, because the there's more sampling step and the diffusion process is longer, we will see uh, crispier images or like more with more detail, like whatever you can say, right? So it's always better to start with like lesser sampling. And if you're getting something good, then you can move forward with, you know, increasing the sampling. What happens in mid journey is a little crazy because they have like really, really beefy uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then, you know, you know, like whatever you put, you're getting immediately uh, high, you know, like high resolution and uh, well diffused, you know, images. So that's a, that's a different story. Let's see what comes out. Yeah. So you're gonna see that you know because the because we increase the sampling steps, it it did more. So this is this is like one is like you know painting. Um, like if you use lesser steps, it's it's kind of like painting the back. You know the the base of the painting, right? So you kind of like do this, and then the if you increase the uh, you know the the diffusion steps, you're kind of like somebody's going and making either like rendering with more detail or, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, looking into, uh, let's say working with a smaller brush. Then can I share my screen for a second? So while we are at, uh, we are talking about prompts. So I'm gonna share one of the best resources for prompt crafting. So moving forward, uh, I think, uh, let's see. Moving forward, prompt crafting will be very important in uh, design processes, right? So again, we were talking about the styles, camera, you know, uh, the, the visual uh, styles uh, or artists, right? So here, if you go to this page, uh, which I'm gonna share in a second, the link, and uh, what's happening here is that you can pick the platform you are using, the tool you are using, and it's going to help you build the build the uh, the prompt. So I checked Mid Journey before because I, that's the heaviest thing that I'm using. I've been using, but today we show Dream Studio in Photoshop. So if you're dealing with that, so you can go here, and you pick a base image. Let's say we're going to make a landscape, okay? And you want to add some details. So you say camera uh, and lens type. So I was talking about that. So it's really interesting if you take, for instance, landscape and electron micros microscope. So you get this like super interesting thing. And I use this super resolution microscopy in one of, you know, uh, one of the image, uh, let's say explorations. It was really interesting or fish islands, right? So let's, let's pick fish islands. So as you see, it immediately popped that up. So it's here. And then we can add film types. So there are, uh, you know, different films. Meaning, film meaning the you know either the size or the old you know let's say the the physical film that is talking about so there's the vintage photogram uh hyperspectral images uh night vision and so on so let's get polaroid okay i'm gonna get the 35 millimeter film and then you can go down you can talk about geometry for instance if i want my landscape to be shaped by um, let's say let's say styles Polyhedra, it's something that I use a lot actually, and I get some interesting results. So let's get polyhedron for lighting. Uh, let's see what I have, front light, backlight, strobe light, which is interesting. Rays of shimmering light, let's get that. Neon lamp, let's get the two, let's get two of them. And then let's go advanced compound details. Okay, in a symbolic and meaningful style, the detailed and intricate. I'm gonna add that materials. It's crazy. So it keeps going, right? So I can add, let's say, let's make it a little, 
thing. So you see, because you're working with the landscape, it's already showing you glass and crystals. And I'm gonna just the amplify that I'm gonna add quartz to that. Okay. So once you go up, this is done now. Okay. So uh, and you can add an image prompt. So I can say, uh, let's make an you know uh, a large building atrium. Okay, so I just add that. And you're gonna see that beyond that, it's also adding a large building atrium, 35 millimeter fish islands, polyhedron, rays of shimmering, right? So hips, it's all here, so I can copy that. Oh, it says run prompt now, I never ran, so I don't know what's, what that make does, but. And remember, I was in Dream Studio. So if I did this for stable diffusion, it would be a different story. So I have Photoshop here open. And I know we connected Dream Studio already. So I'm just going to put my, you know, um, my prompt here. I realized that it's, oh, okay, it's here. All my prompt is here. I'm going to increase the diffusion steps a little bit because I, I want to get some details. Let's make it 80. I'm, I'm going to open a new document. This is going to be whatever size. It's just a small file. This is like 1300 pixels. <clears throat> and I'm going to use like this. OK, let's make it wider. It's more like a in, uh, you know, 16 by 9 uh, aspect ratio. And then no seeds, da, 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 da. how many images do I want? I want four. Let's see, okay, green. We're gonna see what happens now, but you know, all that stuff that I did. <laughs> okay. So this is the funny thing about, you know, like reusing these tools. So I can make a layer from that, hopefully, yep. So it was, of course, it's an overkill, right? I mean, if you, this is a good example because if you, if you do like, if you just kind of like dump everything down, you get, I mean, maybe some of you can find this interesting. Some of you can find that maybe it's too much for you. Uh, so we can make a layer from this and layer from that, okay? So this is kind of like cool use of, uh, you know, the prompt and then you can go back and let's say this was too much. I'm gonna remove these. I'm going to make three images only, and I'm going to you know, get this, and let's add watercolor, as you know, uh, Dana was mentioning. And I say dream again. So let's run this too. And you're going to see that we're getting like slightly smoother images, right? That watercolor already showed the effect. I removed some of the, you know, this hyper detail stuff. So you can see the difference between this image here, the top right, and bottom right, right? So then from there on, you can keep, uh, you know, crafting your, um, crafting your prompt. So as you did this, this is, okay. So it's the prompt mania, prompt builder. I'm gonna send the link now. But again, we could have done this for stable diffusion. You'll see that the examples will change, okay? whatever i'm just kind of like making things up so you you get actually you know you type something here and then you're going to get the the prompt here so you can of course clear the prompt and you know get get the get the new prompt crafted for you again if you have mid journey try that this works super super fine you know you can immediately get like crazy stuff all right great so I wasn't sure if you were here because I don't see you when I'm sharing my screen. So I'm kind of like getting it, feeling a little weird. Uh, but let me share the, uh, okay. So this is the prompt mania prompt builder. Okay, so the web user, I'm gonna go back and see what's happening. The web user bat, web UI user bat is running uh, the, you know, it's running the space, uh, stable diffusion model so then your browser can read, you know, when once you copy the um, 127 point, blah, blah, whatever that link is, Dana showing, um, Dana showed that in the video. That's the, actually, it's, it's, it's the address that stable diffusion is running. So that's why you run the web user dot bat first. And, da -da -da -da. 
Avir plugins to install for you. You may, uh, again, I think Avir runs on, uh, it use CUDA libraries or OpenCL, I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember, maybe OpenCL. So it may relate to your computer, uh, GPU and graphics card designer, uh, the, the graphics card, uh, you know, a type. So, I mean, if you're having a problem, uh, that's okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. It should still, for the main things that we are doing, you're not gonna have a problem. Good, good, good. Uh, it's not letting us run. <laughs> okay. I uh, try to right click it and say uh, run as administrator. And if you are not allowed to do that on your computer, probably if it's a company, you know, computer, it may not let you do it. Yes. Sorry, it's IT. You know, because of that, I was like having a hard time today connecting. IT, IT in design companies are there to kind of like make sure that you're not running experimental stuff. So it's always challenging. Okay. So sorry, sorry about that. Um, did you, do you have the Photoshop Anastasia? Photoshop version, no? No, okay. Well, then you're kind of like stuck with the, you know, the image folder that we shared until again, like until afternoon uh, during which we can run the uh, stable diffusion locally. It, we are almost there. So let's go with the first example. But before that, let's take a let's take a ten minute break because I think like this was quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to give a ten minute break. We meet back at eleven forty. Uh, the meeting keeps running, and then eleven forty, Dana is going to make the first demo. Then we're going to have the I think lunch break. Let me check this. Uh, yeah, either or, depending on the time. Okay. Any questions or comments so far? Okay, 10 minute break. So see you at 11.40. All right, I'm, I'm back if anybody is back. Bitmap plugin. What is the, what is the, what is missing? What is the warning? Um, I, when I open the Grasshopper module, I just get that uh, warning that yeah, it should, um, it should say the plugin name saying this is missing. Like, I don't understand what this is. So it should it should tell us the plugin name. So it says wind and then the object yeah. is bitmap read. Yeah, so I've been getting that error. I don't think wind, wind exists anymore. I'm not sure, but you can make it work without that. Right, okay. Dana? Yeah, uh, I, I, think it, I think it might be part of the Avery uh, package, okay, yeah. but we can. Yes. I think it's just like I'm just using it to show the image in Grasshopper, but it's not necessary uh, okay. necessary to have. So it's the display, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So actually, the latest thing that I sent. So I sent the call app. Uh, Google Colab link. We will look into that. I'm not going to kind of like spend time with that now, but there is again, after this workshop, if you don't have Photoshop, if you cannot run stable diffusion locally, Google for Google Colab, you just need to have a kind of like Google account. It's gonna use your G Drive, Google Drive, which you have by default, if you have a Gmail, and then you will be able to run exactly the same version of the local uh, stable diffusion on the cloud for free. So because this is like a Google open research, they let you use their slower GPUs uh, free of charge. All right. So uh, we're going we're gonna to look into that after Dana run makes this first run. Great. Uh, okay. Are pe people back? Just trying to see because I see only two people. I mean, the faces of two people I know. Show your faces. Hello, before lunchtime, let's wake up. Come on. Great. Two more people. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Okay. No pressure, but uh, okay. One more. There we go. Oscar is here too. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, out of other five people, if you're around, say, hey, we're here so we can get going.
All right, okay. All right, one more, thank you. Great, I think I think it's okay, it's 45, so we can get going, Dana, thank you so much. Great, okay. Oh, I need to be the host again, I think. Okay, so I have the Rhino file open, today's date, image processing, and then the first grasshopper example for 2D pixel mapping. So this example uses the, um, the Hedgehog plugin. You'd be able to do this with native grasshopper components as well, but I think it, it's pretty seamless with Hedgehog. So this this is just showing what image I have linked, and I think that's the the wind um, plugin that that wasn't working for some people. So it's not necessary, but um, this is you know just making sure you you have the right image. But we're specifying the image path to start. So right here, let's right click, select one existing file. And let's see if I remember where I put it. Um, so this will be on the Google Drive as well in base images, but um, you can really input anything here. But for the example, let's just do that. And then all I tried to highlight all of the uh, parameters in red, the things that you'll input. So this first block is essentially generating um boxes where you can draw input curves manually draw them or generate them in grasshopper so if i highlight this um you can see i'm creating a box and then i'm essentially creating copies and so i have five different uh boxes here which are representing pixels that will then map to color ranges so below that, we are specifying the curves in each box. So I have on this green layer, I drew these uh, abstract shapes into each pixel box. And then I did the same thing with linking, right-clicking, setting one curve for each box. So as you see, when I go through and highlight these, they're just in order from left to right. So the idea with this was, um, you know, getting an image, this is an abstract representation of a building, but um, the application of this could could be like similar to like a facade panel study or something like that. So um, my image is looking at black and white values and bright, you know, dark and bright values and mapping different shapes. Um, along those values. So it's kind of separating those values into five chunks. So then when I preview the final thing that Hedgehog is doing, it's, as you can see in the white areas, it's mapping this square curve. And then it's in the dark areas, it's mapping the smaller panel. So the idea might be you know, if you want a larger opaque panel, maybe where there's more sunlight hitting a facade, maybe you want a larger window opening um, with indirect light, something similar. Very abstract, but it just shows the concept. And one thing to note is the resolution of the image. So right now I have, I'm creating, um, just like based on the size of the image, it's it's not very large. So I'm specifying, um, you know, the number of, of divisions. And so I think you can, you can bump up the resolution as well, but just for ease of use, um, you can see like my image is 512 by 512 pixels. Um, and I'm, you know, only creating only creating a rectangle this size. So that, I think it's referencing the size of the original image. So depending on what size image you plug in, you'll be able to get a higher resolution there. 
and you can also preview it in black and white as well. Yeah, Dana, there's one great point from Arif. Uh, he's saying that if you don't have the win because you are reading the image dimensions uh, from the aviary, uh, maybe uh, we can just kind of like input the width and height of the image. Uh, yeah, so by, this either by hard numbers, parameters, or you know another tool. Let's show that. Yeah, so I guess this is the wind thing too, which is reading the bitmap. So I'm inputting the file path, but then but Dana, can we show with with the image sampler? So the image display, sampler, so yeah. Yeah, 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 just let's get, get rid of this and then check the image size and just just put sliders for that. So it's fine. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, I think we have to make this. Um, a mesh, right? Or a surface instead of, can we do this? No. So let's see. If we just put. Yeah, if you don't drag actually on the image sampler, just double click on the image sampler. And load it in. And load it in, that's it, yeah. Yeah, so if you want, you should be able to run it by just inputting that. But then if we don't want to. Uh, yeah, image. Yeah, great. Yeah, if we don't want to input the image path, we can just link the image through here. And then that should be fine. Yeah. And then this. Actually, you can still keep the path. That's fine. Yeah. yeah just, just for the display purposes, because you don't have to display it. That's what I was trying to say. Oh, gotcha. OK. So yeah, just for the display for people yeah. to see it. Yeah. OK. So yeah, we don't necessarily this one either. Did everyone? Get that running okay. You got it? Okay. Did you use different images? Anybody using different image? Christina, are you able to show your screen share your screen or is it not ready? I can make you a host for like 30 seconds. No, I'm working on a different screen. <laughs> okay. All right, no pressure. You can share the screenshot if you want to. I All will. Right. Okay, great. So uh, maybe Dana, you can also change the, this is running and I think it's a simple breakdown. And maybe you can show, you know, what happens when you change the shapes, Dana, you know, the curves to begin with, right? So we are looking at the pattern mm -hmm. uh, on the left. And yeah, so uh, could, you, could you bake the result, like bake the results? Uh, yeah. Now and then let's change the curves and see how the pattern kind of like responds to that. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing, let's change the image yeah. too. Great. So, so one nice thing here is Dana is doing that. So she baked that and then uh, she's going to change the shapes. What I'm thinking is if you had a sequence of images, like the very first video that I showed with the, with the paintings, or if you can, let's say, get a movie scene, right? 30 seconds of a movie scene extract frames for that video and run this in batch, you, you actually, you know, kind of like projecting your, you know, video processing by generating those shapes for uh, for the movie scene, right? So it's, it's right there. Okay. So let's see if I... So this is all random, what I'm telling you.
Nice. I love it, Sophie. Sophie just shared the, you know, a screenshot of what she did. And, uh, you know, she used one of the circular images that I was playing like two days ago. And I really like the, uh, I really like the fact that the, the bright areas, the halo, if you download that image, you're going to see it. Uh, Dana, can you go to, sorry, like I'm, I'm asking too many things. Dana, Dana, can you do the thing? Can, Dana, yeah. could, you, could you check the chat? Yeah. And Sophie sent a, yeah, exactly, that, that yeah. image. So I like the fact that, you know, how that bright area is like sinking in geometrically in the rhino site, right? So you can also, you can also kind of like lift this thing up into 3D as well, if you want to, right? Just using kind of like height feel or heights for each polygon. So uh, it's interesting. Thank you. But yeah, I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any other takes on the pixel mapping um, and how we could use, how we could use that. But I think I use the uh, Slack to upload, but I haven't changed the geometries. Okay, so Slack, unfortunately, we didn't implement Slack. Uh, we, so we are not really using it. Uh, if you want to uh, upload to the chat, that would be super nice. So Arif is asking Dana the, the logic between the distribution of components, which is uh by the color or the brightness value could you again show that that portion please yeah so my take is that so this is just like a standalone plugin so we can't so i'm not like getting in here to see but um i think it's ba it's like essentially like changing the color value to grayscale and then mapping the curves in chunks from light to dark um, or, you know, white to black. Um, and so the order, the order of how you input these curves is important. If you change the order, you'll see, um, like in Sophie's example, you can see how the square is, is on the lightest portion, like closest to white. And then the darkest portion has like the, thin rectangle so it looks like it's going from dark to light as zero to one yes but at the same time there is like blue too right so blues are rectangular yeah. too so let me yeah. let me explain that for you all can we go back to the script yeah okay so here's what's happening once you feed an image the hedgehog uh, it gives you two outputs mainly. One is the brightness. Could you put a panel, uh, Dana, for me to, so we yep. can read? Okay, so we're gonna put a panel. We're gonna read the brightness. Yes, exactly. So brightness values are from zero to one, okay? Zero being black, pure black, one being pure white, okay? But don't forget, a um, like a light blue is also closer to white than black. Right, so because it's about the brightness of the of the pixel. The second thing you get, actually, it's the first thing you get is the color. So let's let's check the panel. With the same panel, just attach the color. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter or the copy. Okay, the color is already giving us the RGB values of the pixel. Right, so red, green, blue. You know, all the all the colors are uh, you know pretty much. You either use the CMYK. Uh, color coding or you use the RGB color coding. Okay, the basic difference between these are this. So one uses red, green, and blue, and it's like the logic of light. And so if you combine all the spectrums of light, like the rainbow, you know, when you put a crystal, you get the rainbow colors. When you combine them, you get white light. So RGB, in essence, when you use it as a light, you get white on the uh, intersection. But on the CMYK space, which is a substance, uh, you know, it's more like a paint. If you mix everything, you get black. Okay, so that's the that's the difference between like CMYK and the K refers to black actually in CMYK, which I can show in a, a second. So here, uh, Dana is like pulling the brightness, which is the gray value, and again feeding it to the K of CMYK, which is again black, right? So it's kind of like doubling a little bit. 
uh, what's happening. So that's that's off right right now. So that we are not seeing. What we see on the screen is the other one, which is taking the color. And as Dana said, it's kind of like because you have five geometries, it's splitting the color space uh, into five, right? So it's kind of like distributing those shapes according to that. So let's, could you turn on the other preview instead of the color, color shape? Yep. Yeah. And they are different. And the reason, reason is one is using the color directly. So it's taking RGB and again, it's not necessarily using the, actually you can drag maybe, uh, oh, you are getting the color. Okay, the, the CM, you are building a CMYQ with that. So mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. Okay, so one is reading the brightness of the pixels. The other one is dividing the color space and the color space does not equal to, uh, you know, uh, the, the brightness of the image. So that's what it is. Actually, the nice thing is we kept using Hedgehog uh, for this workshop, which is very, it's a like five-year-old plugin, I think. It, it has some glitches, but it's a great way to kind of like uh, immediately pull the color uh, information of uh, pixels and then attribute geometry to it. So that's that. Are there any other questions about this? Oh, okay. Chris sent, Chris sent I an have, image. Sure. I have a couple of questions. The first uh, is about resolution. I didn't hear how we can, mm -hmm. I didn't see actually how we could, um, make mm -hmm. I don't see it actually in the in grasshopper mm -hmm. let me yeah uh, meaning using the hedgehog right yeah meaning yeah yes let me show you in, that in this uh, in this definition yeah. yeah 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna show it to you let me open a file while we are at it, could you, Dana, open the other image that Chris shared, I guess? Let me find the files here. Yes, I think I have. It. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because like image processing, in my mind, I think it's never going to get old. Uh, and just seeing this stuff is uh, super, super interesting for me still. Still meaning I've been doing like image processing 20 years, like I have a thesis, a PhD dissertation, which used image processing as a tool, you know, even starting with watercolor paintings and so on and so forth. And I still find it fascinating because you can embed so much information into, into images and then, you know, you can also transfer that information to in different ways. All right, I'm gonna answer that question in a second. Are there any other questions beyond this like resolution question? I take that as a no. Is there like a super easy way to to bake uh, by color without without making each one of those different layers? Yeah, so I think the easiest way will be making a mesh. So instead of using curves, that was mm -hmm. a way to, there is a way to bake the curves with colors, which I don't remember now. We can look at it later. Yeah. But what I would do is I would just make like uh, meshes using the curves I have. And then you can immediately attribute the uh, curve color, cur the, the color of the curve to the mesh vertices or the mesh faces. Mm -hmm. And when you bake it, you get the colored mesh. Okay. And when you render it, you get the color, which I'm going to show in the afternoon, right? So that's exactly Perfect. actually what I'm going to do. Perfect. Uh, any other question? Okay, so you're kind of like making me, uh, Dana, can I share my screen for a second? Just sure. to answer this question. And let me go here. Let me open the file so I can show that really fast and in the meantime please again like send your questions 
if you don't have anything to do, let me do this. So I'm going to get back to that question, but uh, let's do that while I am showing this. You can go to this link, collabresearchgoogle.com. Okay. And just, you know, if it is asking to, you know, like you just need to it kind of connect it to your Google Drive. If it asks for that, say that that say yes, and then I'm gonna send two files now, which we are gonna open later. So let me send those. Okay, I just sent them those on the on the chat too. So this EAC Tech 2022 stable diffusion file actually helps you run locally, which I'm gonna show in a second. But let's go back. So you have those files now. I'm gonna show it again. So don't, don't, no, don't panic. So we are not, I know I'm multitasking, but you know, just, just to be efficient, but we're gonna, we're gonna do it together. Okay. So let me share the screen first. Great, so this is the, I'm having so such a hard time. I don't know why I can't see you once I open this window. Where are the people? Okay, let me see if I can. No. Anyway, okay, I assume you are there. I can see you for some reason. Uh, so here I'm using the same, um, I, if only I could type. Okay, so I have hedgehog, right? So I just put it and then I'm gonna say I need one file. Okay, so I'm gonna right click this, select one existing file. Uh, God knows where the files are. Okay, so I think it should be here. I'll get, I'll get any image, doesn't matter. Let me go one back, let's have fun. How large is this? Okay, I'm gonna check. Okay, this is like 453 to 453 pixels image. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna just put that here, path, right? Nothing is happening. And I know that image was 453 to 453. This is the best practice I usually apply. So I open a panel and if this is for square image. You can do it for rectangular with two parameters. So four, five, three. All right, so that's the pixel width. I'm gonna put it. So what I can do is I can use this directly for width and height, right? So, oh, that's done. And then I can use like here method. Do you wanna run that? And I say, yes. So just to toggle true. There are no geometries for mine. I'm just gonna use one geometry. So I'm gonna delete. If I zoom in, you're gonna see these delete, delete, delete. And for the geometry, let's say, I'm just gonna make a box and I'll be done with it. So I can just make a center box, which is here by default in the center of the coordinate system. And X, Y, Z is one. Fine, I'll just keep it that way and just connect this box here. Let's see. Why? And I get an error. It's funny. Let me mesh this and see if it helps. Okay, yeah, it didn't like B rep. Okay, so I just meshed it and the mesh works and it creates this thing. Okay, so let's try to understand what's happening here about the size. Okay, this looks a little weird and I know my box edge, this edge length was, if I check X, Y and Z, they're all like one. So I can make that box larger because otherwise the pixel look pixels look too far away from each other. Actually, I can make them even almost like 10 times larger, but let me go with five for now. So just make a slider. Okay, so I have a larger mesh and well, it looks more manageable. Great. Okay, so, and Remember, my image was 453 pixels uh, wide, so I'm applying that. If I draw a line here from 0, 0, 0 to 453, 
it hits right at the end of the image. And I can do the same for the height, four, five, three units, and yep, it's done. I mean, it's showing because I'm not in the corner of that, it's of course kind of like offset here, which makes sense. If I shift it, it's gonna be the frame, that's fine, but I'm gonna keep it this way. So what I do is depending on uh, how many boxes I'm trying to get, uh, I change this number. So I put in multiplier here. So I say from 0 0.1, okay, dot, 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 to two, let's say. So I'm getting a slider from 10% of one, which is 0 0.1 to two, right? So I just put that. And then I multiply this number, which is my, you know, pixel width and height, the resolution with this number. Let's set it to one first and see what happens. So I'm gonna set it to one. So I'm checking what's happening here. And I multiply that and I just put those width and height here. Nothing changed, why? Because it's, you know, multiplied by one, still reading that pixel dimension. So if I make it smaller, it's kind of weird, you know, like what I would expect this because the image size is not changing, right? I mean, the image that I'm using is the 453 pixels. I'm just trying to sample less, maybe let's say, you know, instead of getting a pixel sampled in every 10 pixels, I'm trying to sample maybe every 20 pixels, but it's not giving me that scaling down. So that's a, that's the weird thing about Hedgehog. It, it takes a while to get your head around it, which is not the same uh, with the image sampler that Grasshopper has, right? So in the image sampler here, uh, actually it works in a different way. So you just pick, you know, pick another image and then you sample uh, and you can change how densely you are sampling the image by using parameters. Okay, not to confuse you, I'm skipping that for now. Dragging this back to one. And here is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to make a preview, custom preview. And my geometry is these guys, right? Oh, let me let me turn this off. By the way, you made me do the what I was gonna do in the afternoon, but it's good. That's fine. We're gonna do it anyway. Okay, so that's it. And for the material, I'm gonna use the color. All right. Okay, so now we see. Actually, that's the that's exactly the you know the the image from the movie. But let me go back to. Um, let me go back to here, find a colorful image. Let's go here. Let's make it fun. Okay, here is. Okay, I love these. At some point, I was doing these, like it's kind of, I think I'm obsessed by clouds. I keep getting back to them. Okay, this this thing. This is supposed to be a laptop and it's a cloud is sitting on the laptop. Okay, so that's the idea. And uh, let's let's find this image here, which is a pretty large, pretty large image, just to make more sense of the process. Let's say select one existing file, go to that folder, find the image, which is this one or that one. Let's see, the size is 248 by 248. So this is 2048 pixels. It's much larger image, right? So let's see if we get that one or, oh, actually we can use also these maybe. This, okay, let's get this one. This is 2048 by 2048. So I'm gonna get that image, you see? Okay, so, and I need to make this 2048 this time. So I, I would rather, that's what I'm saying. Then, I get the full resolution image, okay? Wonderful. So again, if this is too big for me and if I want like less sampling, now I can use my multiplier to adjust the resolution, right? So it's kind of like going down, becoming more abstract. The image is still there, but sampling is different. And if, I, if you go higher, you're gonna see, it's getting much, much better. And I can even bump this to two in the risk of exploding everything. Uh, it's, it's doing pretty well because at the end of the day, I have uh, 42,025 
boxes now, mesh boxes. So it's always a good practice to use mesh for this reason. If you feed the surface or breath, the computer will explode. So it's not recommended. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, <laughs> let's say this, this happened to me, you know, because of that question, this is going to be my first demo file, which I'm gonna include in the drive in a second. And in the afternoon, I'm gonna show some similar stuff, but before I do that, let me ease it a little down. And the nice thing now is, because this is mesh, uh, I can get a mesh here. Uh, actually, I can, I'm gonna show that later because this is going beyond what I was trying to show. So that's it. Let me stop here and ask, uh, are there, was this clear about the resolution? I think it was a great question. And you know, like once you yeah. work with this, you can, you can master like hedgehog. My only problem with Hedgehog is, you know, I like the sampling going down the resolution. I wouldn't expect it to shrink and enlarge the image, right? So I would rather have it constant and change the sampling. But anyway, there's a trick for that, which I can show in the afternoon as well. Wonderful. So any, any, other, Im uh, any other images, any other questions? No, any, any, is it working for you? Did it work? Can I see thumbs up for the people who are work for? Yeah, all good. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, wonderful. So, just want to make sure that we are being useful, you know. So that's important, right, Dana? Awesome. Okay, yes. so we still have some time. This is good. We are on time, and actually, we showed some extra stuff too, which is great. Uh, I really want to. Before we hit um, lunchtime, Dana, I, will, I was able to run the local stable diffusion on Colab. So now everybody, everybody can run this, okay? We, it's, it's miraculous, thanks to Diego. He sent something this morning as I was talking and now we can run stable diffusion in a browser. You don't need to do anything. All the installation we showed you, it just happens. Uh, automatically, so that's 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 great. So Dana, what I would like to do is, uh, if you are not missing anything from the first demo, if you're missing anything, if there are any questions, if you want to show anything else, let's do that. And then I jump to Colab and show that, and then we give a break and we do your second demo once we come back from lunch. Sounds good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So are there any other, before we move forward, any other questions that you would like to ask? I take, I take that as a no. Dana, I have anything one. you would like to say? Yeah, please. Yeah, I just have one comment. I think, you know, if, if you want more control over the mapping of the geometry to pixels, you could, you could build this thing with just native grasshopper components and do like a box mapping. Um, transform so um that's one way then you would be able to specify like the divisions of color and how you want that do you have it there now or i don't <laughs> that's okay. i don't have it yeah yeah that's okay it's it's you know what i used to do so what i do is exactly uh yeah i map so what i do is i make a bonding box and then which which you know whatever the result is, I make a bonding box that includes the full image. And then I have a preset box that I wanna use all the time. So what I do is I kind of like keep, you know, scaling it down into that box or scaling it up into that box. So I, all the results that I'm getting are always the same, all right? So that's that. So let me go show, so, so just to show you how playful this can become. Let me do this. Oh my. Who is the who is the host now, Dana? Is it you or me? I think it's me. Okay. Okay. So let me I'm trying to open something. Okay, wonderful. Let me scroll scroll down a little bit. I have one question. Um, yes. When you're I'm just wondering like in your office like at new balance in the practice of using these workflows so like hedgehog is a plugin that hasn't been updated in a while like you said so are you would you ever 
sort of like rewrite this one plugin or something like this just to have more control over it? Or do you think, since it's so specific, maybe it's just fine as it is? Hedgehog, I, actually, I brought the Hedgehog discussion to Dana because I've been doing like a lot of, uh, I, can, I can talk about this, you know, uh, showing some images to you. Uh, yeah, it's just personal. To be honest, I, I haven't, we are not using Hedgehog at work at all. It's not needed because there's the image sampler and image sampler is going to give you, you know, my, way more control and we would rather have something custom, as you said, right? And again, in the past, uh, my image processing work was mostly on uh, processing, right? So I was just using a processing and years ago, it's kind of, funny, but my master's thesis was in Mac, 3D Max script, which was a C-based script. And because I was trying to render images and then make 3D Max read the image that it renders. So this was like 16 years ago, I realized that I was trying to make a machine learning algorithm, right? Without knowing what it was. So, uh, but what we do is also like Dana is looking into uh, Python for a while. Dana, did you, have you ever, you wrote, oh, it was the renamer for images, but not necessarily image processing, right? Have we done anything for image um, processing just in Python? The, just the um, color uh, color algorithm for yeah. the, yeah, for the knit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah. yes, we, we have custom tools. That's the, that's the short answer. Great question, because you don't want to go with something that is so again, in my in my mind, I like Hedgehog for the workshop, right? Because here in all the workshops that I'm trying to do, I think it's very important for us to teach the method and understanding. The tool, you can change it. Today it's Hedgehog, tomorrow it's processing, the next day in Photoshop, something new comes out and so on and so forth. So that's the, and I think Hedgehog serves that, uh, you know, uh, purpose really well because we don't have to spend too much time going into, oh, pixel bitmap and you know x y and you know arrays and so on and so forth so we have we don't have to go through that if you have time go through it it's really useful you know maybe you already know it i mean it's image processing is crazy heavy and it's it's challenging but it's really really rewarding as well mm. makes so, sense thanks sure let me share this so anything you see here uh are like this is the you know this is the thing that i showed you which was uh, you know, I was generating these in S-scan style again and then blending them in After Effects, I guess. So this is a real painting, right? So this is a close-up photography of a real painting. And then these are the clouds that I was mentioning. But you're going to realize that. So I, I, I started using Hedgehog at some point because of teaching and it became so handy. And this is one of my students at MIT just experimenting with a physical, you know, like dripping uh, experiment, which is very reminiscent of, you know, these kind of like forms. So I really like that. Uh, but let's go to, so it was really handy in, so this is a super complicated, you know, super heavy mesh. This is literally a strawberry photograph. So I was taking a strawberry photograph and just making like layers of layers and layers of, uh, different ways of like reading the pixels. And then uh, pick, like color color spectrum and the you know the distances between pixels and meshing them in different ways depending on the color. So Hedgehog again, like instead of writing these custom things because I have the color and brightness information, I can just pull them, connect them, and then you know create these these images. Okay, so I wanted to show these actually. So this is literally uh, what it's doing is uh, it's it's just using what what we sh what I showed. So and what I'm doing is instead of using one single image, uh, I'm using like series of images or, or I'm using a parameter which takes the, you know, pixels. Actually it's one single image, sorry, it's using one single image, but it's using the brightness value uh, to determine the scale and the rotation, uh, rotation of the images. So from there on, again, this could be data too, right? So you can be an architect, you can talk about the building this was a little bit of glitchy one, which I really like. So they're kind of like, the, the, the movement parameter is so high, they go crazy. And then, you know, they kind of like go back to zero and um, they're kind of like more relaxed. This should be a subtle one. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a great way of kind of like telling the story. Im imagine having this, 
you know, again, I think it was like very fashionable to have these uh, like moving facades and, you know, kinetic facades like 20 years ago and just modeling those things. And here again, it's exploring a different sort of like rotation uh, in, in three dimensions and so on and so forth. So th this can go forever. And I think these, these are cool. If you have seen the movie, I really like uh, the lighthouse. I, re I really love this scene where he's like, oh, you know. Uh, and then, you know, this is pretty much, again, using Hedgehog and just taking a beaver bird mesh. I'm using a mesh again for this to be lighter and just kind of like, you know, slightly sweeping the space uh, in three dimensions. And that, then there comes these like architectonic, uh, you know, uh, expression. So interestingly, you know, everybody asked how I was doing these. And this is the workshop that I'm like totally opening it up. So these are already, I don't know how old they are, but uh, this is from 127 weeks, makes like two years plus. So anyway, okay, you got the idea. Now, so what we're going to do is uh, we will go to Colab. All right, so I want you to go to call app research Google com and if it asks you to log in, please log in. So I'm using my, you know, one of my Google accounts here. I'm logged in. Uh, and, uh, and I should be ready to go. Okay, so the next thing is you will download uh, the um, files that I sent you. Okay. And among those files, what we're going to do is we will pull, coming in a second, just need to find it here. Okay, the name is, I just sent the two files to you and the file name is this. Oh, not that, sorry. That's a path, this is a file name. All right, so you got it. I just, I'm just trying to make life as easy as possible for you. So what we're gonna do is, you don't have to do anything at all. <laughs> just, just use this file. All right, okay, so in Colab, I'm assuming you are in. So we're gonna say file uh, and open notebook. And it's gonna ask you to consent to give access to, um, to Google Drive. And then in Google Drive, it will open uh, a folder for you, like a, co a collab folder. So what you need to do is in your Google Drive, you need to go to that folder, which I have here. Okay, so this is my drive and I have collab notebooks. And what I did is literally from my folder here, okay, which I downloaded, I dragged and dropped it here just to upload. Okay, so you upload it to my drive, call app notebooks, which should be there by default once you give consent uh, to call app, okay? And in Google Drive, uh, that's what we need to run. So let me see, file, or I can say upload note, yeah, we can say upload notebook, I think, let me try this. Upload notebook and let's go there again. It should, it should do it. Okay, so it's here. I drag this, drop it, it's uploading. I think uploading is better. Okay, let's do that. So you say file, upload notebook, easier. Just upload the file. Okay, great. So it's step-by-step, step. it's saying give access to G drive to store images. So the, what is, what? What's happening in Colab is you have these pieces of code and it's like open source. So people kind of like implement different things. And the nice thing is now it's using a newer stable diffusion uh, algorithm version, which is 1.5, we shared 1.4 uh, with the local installation. So you can click these one by one, or you can say file, uh, sorry, runtime, run all. Just do that. So. Again, very simple, file, upload notebook, drag and drop, runtime, run all, that's it. You will run that, okay? It's gonna take a while. It's gonna take maybe 15, 20 minutes depending on your connection. And finally, at the end of the 
uh, this notebook here, you're gonna get a link, this link, okay? You click that link and it's gonna open <laughs> this interface, which is exactly the same interface that Dana was showing you. And I said, you should learn it because it's gonna be useful. And here you go, it, took, it didn't even take one day to get there, okay? So I copied what I was, the, the prompt that I built uh, for uh, the Dream Studio, remember in Photoshop, we did this. Let's go back to that, remember that? So I just kind of like copied and pasted it here and here. Well, this, is, this should be crafted for stable diffusion, but I'm using it from, just to compare it from um, Dream Studio. And let's say, um, cinematic and so on and so forth, whatever, it doesn't matter. So uh, here again, what I can do is sampling steps is at 20 just to compare and I'm doing only one image. So I'm gonna say generate. You will realize that, uh, oh, now, now it's running faster because I waited, I guess, but it's gonna run slightly slower than what you get in local if you have a good GPU. Most of you don't have that. So it's good for you, I think to have this. So what we're going to do is we will create uh, four images instead of one. And I'm gonna, again, make it landscape images. So I'm gonna make it 768 by 384. And then I'm gonna keep the sampling, you know, steps there still just generate it. Okay, so it says 17 seconds, 16, 11. So it's taking a little more time, but hey, here you go. You don't have to install anything anymore, which is great. Um, done. Okay, so what I do is I usually do this. Data, data painted on a skyscraper. Uh, let's say tall poly. Oh, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see that. Okay. And let me do that. Oh. Tall polyhedral building. Backlights. Okay. Uh, glass and crystals. And Translucency. I'm just gonna get that intricate. So sometimes this insane detail in intricate stuff is becomes like super noisy. So do we need to make it hyper realistic? Maybe. Yeah, that's okay. I don't want details. I don't want watercolor. I don't want cinematic. That's fine. And let's say generates. Would prompting, I would start simple uh, because it's always, you know, if you want to track, if you want to understand the working inner workings of a system, see, okay. Oh, this is, I am impressed. I can't see data yet, but you know, it's, it's not bad. So uh, anyway, I'll stop here. So just to make sure that um, you got collab, you know, kind of like, going did any like could, can i get again like thumbs up for that no okay what is the what is the problem christina for call up no problem still running oh, oh okay no but yeah, it started installing right yeah oh, okay that's fine it's great great okay yeah i just wanted to no i i i i thought like it's not working at all so that's great any questions Dana, did you get this? Is it installing too? Yeah, it's still it's still running too. This is this is gonna be a lifesaver. Yeah. And again, maybe um, yeah, start simple. For instance, like data visualization of a building or on facade or like two D data viz, you know, like whatever. Because we're just trying to make colors and like that. And just have fun for now. But again, I think the logic here is that, you know, you can get serious, right? So 
I, I on purposefully, when I um, wrote the description for this workshop, I said, okay, just let, let's make it um, playful, right? So we're just gonna make like fake data images and so on. But you know, on daily basis, for instance, at New Balance, we we work with like real sports athlete data, and it's a, it's a it's a big hassle to uh, you know both like just collecting the data and then parsing it and then developing and like an understanding of how you can use that for design, and then using it and then also checking if it is working or not. Right. So that's like multiple steps of dealing with data. Same goes with architecture. So I remember us running, uh, you know, solar uh, solar insulation uh, algorithms, and in, in 2007, Eco, that was a tool called Ecotect. I don't know if you even ever heard it. Like Ecotect was bought by Autodesk later on. So it was interesting because it was you couldn't really create a mesh and you know like ex import it to Ecotech because the meshing algorithm was not working. So. Arif, just going back to your questions, for instance, I had to write a code which was taking any form and creating a mesh file that Ecotech could read. So I was kind of like creating my own mesh in the file format that Ecotech had, right? So that was the custom solution. And then we were kind of like running uh, even the like shadowing simulations that we that we wrote in Rhino Visual Basic. Right, so we had a team in KPF again for the KPF fellows, right? So this was in New York again, 15, 16 years ago. So data, data is all, always there. And I think like there's no one single uh, solution. Like there's no single one single clear answer to how to, how to use it. But these kind of, you know, like uh, explorations at least make you understand how you can, how you can tame the image, how you can take an image and, you know, go from like 2D to 3D. Let me see, so I'm trying to get something. Uh, if you're using Midjourney, you're gonna realize that um, Midjourney is, it's, it's really skilled, okay? So they, they, the developers, I've been listening to their, you know, community calls. Um, so if you haven't give, given it, you know, like try to Midjourney, I, I would suggest you do it. Because they they bake the algorithm by including a lot of you know like they they created the data set really well because all of this stuff is trained by using millions of images right not all the images in the world not every image in the world so they are kind of like being very selective about which images they use to train these AI models and Mid Journey out of the box is super artistic right so it's kind of like creating these, you know, cinematic effects, painting, you know, like effects and so on and so forth, architectural renders and so on, where Dolly, for instance, Dolly 2 is trying to be photorealistic always. So it's either super abstract or like, if you say realistic in Dolly, it immediately tries to make a photo because that's like, uh, that's the goal. That's the take of the algorithm. Whereas here you can, you have a, like a, you know, like wider, nicer spectrum. So I just got this, like I said, data visualization of building, nothing colorful came out. So I said heat map, and then I kind of like started getting the, these kind of images. So it's showing a world map, maybe just reading the heat map or oh, it's thinking not the heat map, but so I can use for instance, turbo colors, turbo colors. Turbo is the usual, you know, like green to green to red, uh pressure you know visualization uh, we usually use is that just just call like turbo there's you know you can use inferno or plasma which are more like mm, yellow to purple actually instead of speaking about that i can show you turbo color map so that's yeah that's this is this for instance you can you can influence your data with that or you can say um, plasma. See, so, and once you Google that, actually you find stuff like this, which is really cool. So, okay, see, this is cool. This is copper, so this is globe. Globe is very cool because it's kind of like earthly colors too. Rainbow, color, sea land, right? So you have this, and this is again like plasma and uh, magma, inferno, which are really close to each other, to human, human eye. 
but they are not really uh, very this is interesting so some some software have these implemented already right so you can just kind of like get let's try one let's say uh, plasma beta colors kind of thing let's see let's see what happens once we do that Okay, I'm gonna do this because mine is running. Where's that? Here, here. Okay, so data visualization, plasma. Okay, so this plasma color spec. Why are you doing this? Plasma color gradient. Paint it on a wall, let's say concrete wall. Okay, so this time I'm gonna increase the diffusion uh, sampling steps, you know, so it diffuses a little more to give us a uh, more playful stuff. Yeah, actually these were nice. I, I kind of missed that. This is the last thing I ran. I don't know what I edit or subtract, but it's interesting. See what comes out now. Of course, it's taking more time because I bumped this like 50%. It's already much slower. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, it's okay. Not too crazy. I would go with this one because this is not too bad and I can push it even more. Uh, this is the last thing before I stop sharing my screen. So let's generate this. So this time, it's gonna take quite a bit of time because I doubled from 30. So let, let this run and I'll let this run. Let's, let's make a gut check with you all, see if you are done with installing. What I want you to, what we want you to do with Dana is uh, for you to think what you want to explore. Uh, again, go to images folder in the Google Drive files, you know, and see if you if you are inspired by any of those images. Or you can say, hey, I'm gonna make a you know canopy design. I'm gonna make twisting towers. I'm gonna make data about rabbits, you know, running in the field and eating carrots. Whatever you want to do, that's fine. Uh, oh, this is nice. This is kind of like painterly. Mm. And then because once you get back here. So let me stop sharing. Once you get back, what we're gonna ask is, uh, keep that in mind, right? So for the rest of the day, you'll have like four hours to go. You can always, once the you know stable diffusion starts running, you can go back to that and you know explore your ideas. And in the meantime, you know Dana is going to show the second method for you know converting your. She showed like two D. Now we're gonna move to three D sculptural things. And then we're going to show two options. One is more random, one is more controlled, you know, while doing that. And then I'm going to show, I'm going to continue with what, what I showed you, and I'm going to show you how you can stack images. It's like, you know, when you go into CAT scanning, like when you get an MR, you know, of your body, it's actually slicing you, through, you know, to, to get kind of like, uh, give you a series of images, the sections of, you know, your body. So we're going to do something similar with data, data images. Uh, with that, anybody who got who, whose installation is done, still no, still down. Oh, Christina, you got it. Wow, okay, three people, nice. Dana, yeah, awesome. Okay, so once you click the link, you you see the user interface. This is our. Yeah. So we didn't have this at like ten thirty, ten forty five today. So. You're gonna when when Diego comes, just say thank you to him, you know, because he sent the phone. He's like, oh, it's running, it's working, and so on. So he found it, he dug it, and you know, like found it for us. So that's that's really great. And Diego is also gonna show some uh, playful stuff. What we're gonna do is the nice thing is uh, he's gonna use Colab again. So Colab suddenly became our core, you know, like tool in this workshop, which is great. Uh, he's gonna show how you can inter interpolate between two images. So I usually kind of like do that, you know, picking images and blending them in uh, After Effects, making videos. 
this is going to kind of like create a latent space between you know the images that you pick. So you can we can make two, five, ten images, and then you know uh, create a video uh, by using that. Great. Any any additions? Any Dana? Anything that we are missing before we give a break, or uh, are we good? Any questions as well from anyone? Uh, not a question, but I do have to drop off after this because we're giving our own lecture, but uh, okay. I guess I'll watch the recording and look through the files uh, afterwards. Yeah. But thank Great. you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Good luck with the good luck with the class. Thank I you. wish I could attend yours, but you know, next time. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully there'll be recordings. I don't know if David Great. can send them around Great. or something. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Good. So one question, uh, do you think you can come back well, the official restart time is uh, 2 p.m. Can everybody come at 1.45, like just like one hour later exactly? Anybody having any problem with that? Okay, so uh, Justinia and Everybody else, Mattia, Anesthesia, Hiroyoshi, are you okay with that? Could you just type in if you're fine? If you can make it. What time is it, it now? It's. Uh... It, sorry, it's 12.45 for me. So it's like exactly mm -hmm. one hour later. Okay, so perfect. We're going we're gonna to count 60 minutes down <laughs> and then we're going to meet uh, again. Okay, perfect. So see you in an hour. Thanks a lot. Make sure that, you know, call out is working for you uh, and if not explore the images we shared and we will keep going uh, starting in one hour all right thank you thanks thanks thank you all right hi everyone again welcome back sorry for the video sound because i was trying to get the video thing sold with me sharing the screen on Zoom. And no matter what I do, I, I can't get it done today. I'm like, once I share the screen, I don't see your videos, like, which is not something I prefer. It's better to, you know, see people when you're talking about things. So, uh, but anyway, so I'm gonna see if uh, everybody's here, just to make sure that, uh, yeah, that's cute. Right? Chris, are you here? Yeah, it is great. So I hear that you are you are colleagues with Chi. Is that so? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're just yeah. Chi all the time. Yeah, he yeah. he emailed me today. I couldn't get back, and I just saw his email. Uh, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. How is he doing? It's been a while that I haven't seen him. Oh yeah, he's great. Um, it's an awesome resource and really fun to work with here. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't find it great. great. Please, please, personal, say hi. I'm gonna get back to you know, like by his email. But yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll shoot him a message right now. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna email him too. Uh, that's great. Rustinia, Rustinia, I, I, that, that I'm gonna I need to work on that name. Uh, Matia, are you here? Hiroyoshi. Okay, we got one, two, yes. And I think your the, the other name was Alex, Alexander? I don't remember. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, Alexandra, I'm here. Alexandra, <laughs> okay, see, great, yeah. thank you. Uh, that's great, all right, wonderful. So great to see everybody back. We have Diego, Diego Pinochet, who is, uh, yeah, so Diego, this is what we did, your name, uh, what you do, what what you are doing now, and uh, where you are now. Three sentences. Okay, so I'm Diego Pinochet. I'm from Chile. I'm in my last uh, year at the PhD in defending computation at MIT. And what was the other one? That's it. Three sentences done. <laughs> Perfect. It's as you see, he's an overachiever. He's trying to say another sentence. If you ask for three, three sentences. So yeah, Diego and I go quite a while back, more than ten years, and. Had a chance to work together, spend time together at MIT too. So uh, it's it's great that we also get a chance to um, 
work on this. And actually he sent, as I said, you know, if you want to thank him now, because he's the one who sent the, you know, the call app uh, stable diffusion installation as I was, as we were kind of like wrestling it. So thanks for that, Diego. Okay, perfect. So if you're good to go, what I would suggest is we just continue with the second file, Dana, uh, and do the demo and then uh, take things from there. Great, okay. So let me share. Okay, so the file that we're using is in demo files, um, image to 3D sculpting. And then there's only one that it's the same Rhino file that we used before. Um, and then the grasshopper file, let's do the random V01 file first. And we'll see if we have time to get to the the car the color carving one. So I have it open right here. And I think, yeah, owner and I were talking. Do you think I should build from scratch, owner, as just as we go through, or uh, can, can I see the the whole definition just to make sure that yeah, it's not... there's some like yeah, maybe maybe until the end yeah. of the purple, you know, uh, box. Yeah, and then the rest we can just plug it in. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, some of this stuff I may reference what's already here, but. Um, just as an overview. So this is using, I would say this is like more on the creative side of how can we go from 2D flat image to 3D mesh. And so I utilize the Dendro plugin, which um, I'm not sure who's used it before. Um, and I hope everyone got it installed if they didn't have it, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's using voxel space to to create a mesh that you're able to do um, smooth and do different operations, union operations. So you can really start to carve like very cool conceptual forms um, out of it. So the first thing we'll do is, um, let me open the chat here. Okay, the grasshopper file is um, this, 3D mesh mapping random V01. And it's in the, I'll just show it again. It's in the main folder on drive, demo files, 3D image to 3D sculpting. And then there's two grasshopper files. Um, it should be the version one. So we're using the same um components in the beginning as the the previous 2d definition so um link the path file path that one image file maybe i'll do a different image so we can compare maybe this one and then also we're essentially creating a bounding box um, to display the image as a mesh. So let's set the pixels. And then this image uh, viewer, I think it is, no, import image. So import image creates a mesh. So you can see if I put a panel, the output of this is geometry. So that's what we're converting this, this file to is mesh geometry. So we'll input the rectangle and then we'll input. So this sampling do a slider and put it low. So this X and Y dimension is going to be how many um, mesh faces you have in each direction. So if we 
Okay, so we can see this image now, um, the rectangle. And if I if I move this down, you can see like the resolution, it gets more and more pixelated and the number of mes mesh spaces is decreasing. If I go up, you get that higher resolution. So I was keeping it low just for ease of uh, computation, but you'll be able to experiment with the resolution. Um, and then this is the same thing that owner had uh, demoed in the last in the last session where you're, you know, you're scaling down that original image. So go back here and then I won't, I don't think I'll recreate this block, but I can go through it and explain what it's doing. So summary, we're essentially re taking the color value at each mesh face and we're remapping it to a number. And so that's the first section. Um, so deconstructing the mesh, I'll recreate some of it. And then here you get all of these mesh parameters. So there's 256 vertices, um faces are shown and mesh vertex colors are shown we're going to use the vertices and this mesh closest point is giving me um i i think i'm actually being redundant here because i'm taking the mesh closest point for the vert it's giving me a parameter and then it's giving me a color but essentially i have all the colors right there so if you, if I just copy this, let's see, here, and put, take the color and put it in there, it's doing the same thing. So I can get rid of these two components. So I'm taking the RGB value, I'm deconstructing it, but if you zoom in, there are a couple options with this. Um, this is split ARGB. So it's giving me the separate values, but I'm remapping it, the zero to 255 integer value to a decimal, so zero to one. So if you right click and check integer channels, you can see that changes. And then your output is on that scale instead of zero to one. Um, but instead, I want the decimal value. And I think like the more you get into color conversions and color spaces, you can look at ways to manipulate these color spaces. So like owner was talking about the CMYK um, under, is it display? Yeah, so display tab color, there's H, all of these color labs, LCH. So all these color spaces are slightly different. And so you could uh, experiment with each of these and it would give you different results. So in this case, I'm just trying to simplify it and make and convert everything to a zero to one decimal value. So I can use those numbers to create variable geometry. So I'm using the numbers to size different geometry that I'm making. So this component is just a function. If you double click this, um, I just, t I think this is like the linear RGB con conversion formula. So I just, you know, copy pasted this in and it'll scale these values um, into the zero to one, uh, range that I'm looking for and you're able to like zoom in and um, rename your variables so it's kind of like a custom function and so I you know renamed the RGB here and you can add and delete variables here so let's do
So I'm getting decimal values between zero to one for each vertice on this mesh. Now, I want to remap those values because depending on the scale that I'm working in, um, you kind of have to like envision like, what do you want your final result to be? How big do you want it? How detailed do you want it? So before, before I created this, I was thinking, you know, I just want to kind of extrude some geometry and mesh it and smooth it out. So what I decided to go with was extruding lines. So if we go back up here, I'm going to jump ahead to this component so you'll be able to visualize it. So at each mesh vertice, I'm extruding a line. And so to do that, I just took the vertice from the mesh component and I moved it up in the positive Z direction um, by this these values. So I'm remapping the zero to one decimal value to another set of values that for the size of my line. So the highest would be a thousand mill. I'm in millimeters right now. That's what we do in shoes. <laughs> a um, thousand millimeters max down to zero. So I'm creating this extrusion here. Then the next chunk is, I, I'll jump ahead a little bit to dendro because I think in order to understand like what I'm doing here, you have to understand what options are available in dendro. So dendro takes in Rhino, geometry such as curves, points, B reps, or you convert it to meshes. So curves, points, and meshes. And so I know in Dendro, there's a component called points to volume. And so I like to use that component a lot because you're able to create like a gradual blend of sizes. If you have different points in a row and you can create meshes out of those. So because I want to use points to volume, I'm going to take this curve and divide it by a certain number of points. And in order to make the definition like run faster, the only reason I have this div division component is to reduce the number of points. Um, I'm taking the length of the curve and then I'm just dividing it by X to get less number of points. So it's all linked. So then I have all these division points and I'm, I can plug that directly into this points to volume component. Now let's see what this chunk is doing. Does anyone have any questions so far before we jump into Dendro? Okay. Okay. So let's see. So let's look at what goes into this points to volume. So points, you're inputting a tree of points, or it could just be a flattened list. It doesn't matter. Um, you're inputting a radius value because we're, we're creating a sphere volume at each point. And so the, the radius value, the number of radius values you input has to be the same as the number of point values. And for some reason, if you hover over it and you can see that it says six, nine, seven, eight values, it's different from my radius values. So we can figure that out. Um, so- this, yeah, Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Now the settings, settings, your settings are, yeah, it's dead, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Some? Okay, okay, got it, got it, okay. I can put these on, but. Um, yeah, the, okay. Yeah, so I, let me enable it. So I disabled this because it does take some time to compute. Um, and the voxel size is going to really, uh, really influence the time it takes to compute, which also influences the final resolution of the mesh. So 
four is quite large for some of the things that we do. Like we've we've used 0.2 as a voxel size um, before in some of our workflows, um, but you'll be able to see the mesh resolution at the end. Um, but for each dendro component, it usually has a settings input. And so um, this kind of range of values tends to be pretty optimized for mesh creation. Um, so I think starting here and then adjusting slightly as necessary, you'll be able to see how that influences the final mesh. So, okay. So and, this, uh, yeah. Just wanna make sure a couple of people ask. So the grasshopper file is again in the demo, demo uh, folder. And uh, could, could you just show that again, Dana, just to make sure that yeah, people sure. are following. Thanks. So, in this directory demo, image to 3D, and then it's V01. There's two files in here. It'll be the V01 file. Okay. So, we created mesh from points here. This stuff, you know, is open to interpretation. You could have a consistent radius value. I think if you put in, I think if you put in, let's say, 10, I'm gonna disable this again. I think you can put in one radius value and have it work. So what I think was happening, let's see. Yeah, so you don't necessarily need to have the tree structures match. Um, so this is making all of the points with the same uh, sphere radius. But let's see if we can dig in and see what's happening. So I'm... Dana, right. just, to, just to show the functionality of Dendro, could you just yeah. reduce the distance, the height distance between the yeah. spheres and so we can see what happens? Yeah. Thank you. So let's see if I do like 20 and then maybe, yeah. So maybe a little 50. Okay, and then right now I'm getting, so right now it's, if I put in that, so I'm getting, I'm measuring the length of each curve and I'm using that length to um, specify the number of points or the number of divisions on that curve. So. If you zoom in, you'll see that like this curve length of 50 is going to have 49 points. So that's the reason for the um, division here. So if I divide it by two, you may be able to see it easier. And then let's put this back in here. And I think I need to edit my radius values too. Yes. So imagine the is Dana is kind of like building this thing. Imagine Dendro is a shrink wrap. So what happens is if you have you can use points or curves or surfaces or meshes uh, to wrap volume around. So and what happens is it takes your let's say we put the surface. It kind of like creates a imagine a bonding box around it and it 
subdivides that bounding box into your voxel size. That's what your voxel size is. So if it is 2D, it's pixels, 3D voxels. If you go uh, like with really small number or the edge length of the voxel, you are gonna get the finer subdivision of the space. And then what it does is once you create that like voxelized or subdivided bounding box for this guy, it starts checking each and every box and tries to see if there's any material, any volume from this object that resides in that individual pixel, okay? And then it says, oh, okay, yes, this voxel includes this. So it kind of like creates some sort of like uh, volumetric, you know, entity there. So for this one, you would realize that, you know, this kind of object, this is the iPhone, you know, curve, which is then used by Samsung, right? Uh, so to get this detail, if your voxel size is, let's say this big, then you're not gonna get this fine detail. So you have to go like really, really, really low resolution to capture the such kind of like geometric details. The other thing that's happening in this definition is that you have points and every point uh, is, uh, Dendro is generating a spherical volume around the point if you don't change the parameters by default, right? Because point doesn't have any dimension. And if you offset the direction from a point, that's a sphere uh, by definition. So once you start though, you know, getting those points closer to each other, the two spheres will start intersecting, okay, volumetrically. So there are two ways to deal with this, which I'm gonna show in the file that I'm gonna share. Uh, you can either leave them like that. So there's some sort of like weird mesh intersection that you cannot do anything with for like 3D printing and so on and so forth, right? That, that poses a challenge, but it might be interesting for some other purposes, purposes, right? So if you intersect these two things, you can get a Boolean of that area or you can uh, unify, you can uh, combine those volumes, which is Boolean union, right? To generate a continuous, uh, let's say, R glass shape from those two spheres. So essentially, the very cool thing about uh, Dendro is this. It can do this for any object, any surface, any curve, as I said, and you can use a combination of those things, right? So if you, let's say you can take the surface and you can take four lines, and let's say you can generate a smooth table whose legs are kind of like connected in the corners to the surface, right? And it's gonna kind of like create this, uh, and then you can smooth the, smooth the form the way you want it. And then the geometry that is created is just a volume, and then you can mesh it. And there are also different ways of meshing that. So it's a very flexible platform in which you deal with voxels. Within a voxel space, you generate a boundary representation, DREP, and then you can mesh it in any, uh, any way uh, that you like. And it's very handy for 3D printing because it ends up creating these uh, sealed, closed meshes, right? So you don't have to kind of like go back and try to fix and you know fill holes and stitch edges and so on and so forth, depending on what you're doing, the complexity, but it's pretty handy. Thanks, Dana, for the patience. Thank no, again. thank you. While I was figuring out what, what I actually did here, <laughs> I so my initial thought was create um, a line of spheres with a variable radius, but as I, you know, as I preview this, I'm like, oh, it's, it's all the same radius value, so what happened there? Um, also, just to note, when I reduced the inputs that were going into my radius value, there was an error because I think the the radius values have to be 33% bigger than the voxel size. So if you have an error in your dendro components, it's most likely due to one of these setting values and, the, and changing the voxel size um, can help with that. So when I reduced it from four to point three, it it was able to generate this mesh. So there's a lot of components happening here. Let's step away from that for a second because I want to get this variable radius value. So I just entered a series component, which is creating a list of numbers. And so I just used one as the input, which back here was like the minimum radius value when I'm mapping. Um, let's just say the step size is one. And then the number of values in each series, I'm taking that from this 
list length component, it's giving me, if you compare these two, um, this is a list of points and the list length is saying there are two points on branch zero, seven on branch two and so on. So I'm able to match up the length of that point list with the radius values. So now it looks like I have what I want for my radius input. It should be variable. I'm inputting 8507 points and I have 8507 radius values. So let's see. And I do like to disable the settings, the dendro setting when I make changes. So you can see it takes it takes a bit because I didn't disable that. And the voxel size is also very small right now. So it's taking a long time. While that's happening, are there any questions general or about this, this file? Is anyone familiar with Dendro? Is this like a review or? You haven't used it? Okay, that's good then. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a yeah, pretty, so, pretty hand, handy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dana. Yeah, no, that's why I sometimes I forget. But when you're saving a file that has Dendro, if you disable yeah. the settings before you save it, that helps too. Yep. I had one question. Um, hi, everybody, again. Mm -hmm. And this is Sasha from TT. Uh, so I just sent an image with missing plugin. Um, mm. I was able to kind of uh, follow the workflow without it, but I couldn't find this one exact one on Food for Rhino. Can you? Uh, follow yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is the one we had an issue with before. So if you, I, I'm having a slowdown here, but. Yeah. If, if you just download Aviary from Food for Rhino, the DLLs and the plugins, including Win, should come with it. I downloaded yeah. Aviary, but um, still missing this one. It's it's just for image um, bitmap processing, and we can get around that I can go yeah back I, I was able to get around okay, that I just was great. wondering uh, what it yeah. was because I could oh yeah yeah it. okay probably if you make a clean install you know it's it's it should work uh after a while but yeah it's just like you can put the hard numbers for the height and width and then yeah it should work great thank you yeah okay thank you I may have crashed my file <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, 1.2 minutes. Okay. Okay, you can see it's working. Um, I created these like weird teardrop shapes. I think it's because I have so many points um, yeah. on each line. There's, yeah, like 8,000. 8, so it's calculating that full set of points. Um, so let's, yeah, let's keep going. Uh, I think, I wonder it might help if I flatten these two lists before. No, you know what, actually you flatten, I think this is a great example. If you could play, select the previous one again, 1.2 minutes. Yeah. It's showing us, you know, individual bubbles and actually there are bubbles in bubbles, right? So you have so yeah. many points and it's like high resolution. Let's pick the next one, which is the volume yeah. union. Yeah. Yeah, which is gonna, which is flattening it and combining it. So you already lost, you know, like those, uh, some of the, some of the intersections already got, you know, like sucked in or like bullion union by the overall shape. 
what I would do in this one is because it's so slow, I think you're the resolution, uh, the, the voxel resolution is too high, meaning the voxels are too small. So I would go to Dendro settings and mm -hmm. uh, just, just risk it. And yeah, like instead of 0 <laughs> 0.3 in the voxel size, I yeah. would go with like something maybe even 10 times more or like 4.5 ish for the voxel yeah. size. Yeah. So I was at I was I was at four, and when I reduced these because I reduced yeah, yeah. the lines and then I, I understand those and then I reduced that. But yeah, let's let's do this. Do you want do you want to go back to the original file so we can see the final result instead of experimenting now because sure. it may crash again, you know. And so also yeah. people can see, you know, the file you have. But I mean, if you okay. want to improvise. Yeah, I can open a copy, I think. Let me think it's just going to. Well, Dana is edit Diego for the uh, stable diffusion running on Colab, this super stable diffusion. So I'm checking the uh, the directory that the files get saved, which says outputs slash image to image, blah, blah, whatever. What is, what is, where is that outputs folder? The so you are uh, running which one? The Keras, the very simple or the one with the? Not the simple one, the latest one you sent in the morning. Okay, so let me check that. Okay. I have it here. Yeah. Um, No, it doesn't save to any directory. I mean, you can check, specify it. No, 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 check the settings. If you don't specify, there's a default uh, directory, but we can get back to this because people installed this already. So I'll, I'll let Dana do it. And if we find it, Diego, we can share that. Perfect. Great, thanks. Okay, so here's, here's the original file. And let me... Turn that preview off. That was the line preview as I click through. Um, so here are my point volumes that are then unioned. And then I do tend to use a lot of smoothing in my dendro because I think you can you can really like affect the final result of your mesh. And when it's high resolution, you can get some really interesting shapes. Um, but like when you smooth it out, you can see how like some of the mesh parts like disappear because they're too small. Um, the voxel size just gets smoothed out. Um, and then this section, how are we doing on time? Do we have... Okay. We are fine, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So the reason that this one is more randomized or it's called the, the random, um, version one is because this section of dendro I'm kind of improvising and saying okay I want I want to carve away from the shape and so in order to do that I'm using this volume difference component which like it's like boolean difference um, in the nerves world and so I need to create another dendro volume to to remove out of this one so the way that i did that and there are an infinite number of ways you can do this is creating a box so i'm i'm taking this dendro volume i'm creating a bounding box and then i'm using the populate 3d grasshopper component which is essentially populating that volume with a number of points that I'm specifying in random position. So I just, you know, input a random number of points and then I'm doing the same thing. I'm creating um, another dendro volume from these points with random radius values. And you're able to, you know, change the spread of, of the radius here. And then flattening that list, smoothing it so you get this like cool bubbly um, volume. And then this will difference out those random points from the original volume. And then I'm smoothing it again, which reduces 
some of those weird artifacts you get, like sharp edges and maybe not so clean. And you're able to play with the smoothing settings um, for the desired result as well. And then this last chunk is just converting it back to uh, regular Rhino geometry. So this component volume to mesh, you always need when you're going back from dendro back to get a Rhino geometry to bake out or render. Um, so it just takes the settings. So you plug the settings in. And then right here, I want to assign color to the mesh. So I'm, again, <laughs> duplicating work with these, I can just deconstruct the mesh. And I think just do that. Uh, no. I think it might be because, oh, okay. Oh, I'm going back here. This mesh is not colored. Yeah. No. But so yeah, so this is the mesh that I'm getting out of Dendro, which is has no color assigned to it. And so basically I'm doing a closest point to the original 2D mesh to get the parameter to then use evaluate mesh. And let's make sure these two are going back into, yeah, this is the original 2D mesh that we input. And both of these components are referencing that to get that color value from mesh closest point. So it's essentially like taking the vertex of the 3D mesh, projecting it onto the 2D and getting the closest point value with the color associated with it. So then I'm able to assign color to this dendro geometry. So the color is still extruded. There are ways that you could get like really cool color gradients if you want to go that far. So it's not the same color in the Z direction. Um, so yeah, and then the carving away you can see as well. Does anyone have any questions? Just, just to show the impact, maybe just quickly change the image and let's see what happens, sure. right? So once sure. you once you set the generative system, the generative engine, you can just, you know, like switch the image and yeah, just, just watch it. And then if you have, again, like a, a sequence of images, especially a latent space of, uh, you know, images that morph from one to another one, which Diego is gonna show uh, now, then you can create the animation, you know, something really close to the animation that I showed you at the beginning of the day, right? So then, then you can kind of like go into, start going into like detail, just make it more intricate, maybe add some, and you know, like you can, you can also discover your own style and what you're trying to do with your, with your visual st uh, story. Yeah, so these images that are in the, on the Google Drive, they were created with Stable Diffusion Local. Just for reference, pretty abstract. Um, I have a quick question. Because each computation takes such a long time, do you have any strategy to explore the design space by any chance? Or do you just run a mate and then run a mate? Um, do you mean with like the dendro step of matching? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, yeah, during the design phase, just bumping up those settings, you can start to iterate pretty fast. Um, uh, yeah. So right now, yeah, because of, I mean, it's also the scale of the model too. <laughs> like I have it, you know, extruded in this big thing. So if you like, reduce the scale and also the resolution, then mm -hmm. you can start to iterate pretty fast. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Maybe some additional, yeah, as you, as you see that, you know, the different 
uh, it would be nice to kind of like uh, bake this. And because it's a colored mesh, right? Did you do mesh, yeah. color mesh? Okay, that's great. Yeah. So you can bake it and then you already have the vertex colors on the, on the form. Uh, just uh, about Heli's question. So bitmap processing is usually expensive because if you get an image 400 by 400 pixels even, like which is a very tiny image, 400 times 400 is like 160,000, you know, like pixels, right? So it's a lot. So to begin with, what you can do is you can start really like a loose sampling. So you skip, let's say 20 pixels, 20 pixels, you just skip one in each 20. So keep the resolution of the image low. And you do the same for the voxels for dendro. Actually, like, I think it's like really high still the voxel uh, uh, dimension is really fine here. So that's why it's taking, a, we, we can get this like in a, in, a, in a much shorter time. But again, it's kind of like, I think once you spend time with this, uh, you kind of like understand what parameters work for what scale, okay? Great. One, one nice thing, maybe last thing about dendro is that it is a, a multi-threaded application. So it uses all cores of your CPU. So we were dealing with meshing before we started using Dendro and it was taking forever pretty much on a 16 core machine, just sitting on one core, you know, Rhino 6. Uh, and then with, you know, Dendro implementation or OpenCL implementations, it can run like whatever. If you have 16, 20 cores, it uses all of them and just kind of like gets things done. Any other questions for Dana? Great, one quick thing because everybody got, so I'm gonna kind of like leave the uh, stage to Diego in a second, but let me share this really fast. As um, Dana, thank you. As you know, Dana was from the file, I was experimenting on the side. And again, this is a stable diffusion. We uh, we are running on Colab, so not using any local resources. Again, like not paying any, for anything. And you know, I I I I just kind of like slightly changed, you know, uh, my prompts. You would remember data visualization. Uh, you're seeing my screen, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Data. We we had this uh, plasma color. We had that uh, gradient. Yes painted on a, it was concrete wall. So I made curved wall, eh, I made curved surface. I did pixelated details. Infographics is a very interesting keyword, keep that in mind. And with annotation and graph bars and so on and so forth, right? So I did that. And just to explain you what these are. So batch size is the number of images you get. Let's say if you keep the batch count at one, and make this four, you get four images. If you keep the batch size at four and batch count two, it's gonna give you two times four, eight images and so on. So if you bring this to 10, it's gonna be 40 images. That's gonna take a lot of time. But anyway, so this was, you know, like I, th I think it started generating these kind of interesting results, right? Like reading some annotations and infographics, like, you know, trying to understand what those are, like bars, colors and so on. So you can, I was trying to see because the local one actually saves all images immediately. This one I had to, I had to download them so I couldn't solve it yet. But uh, maybe we figured it out as we move forward uh, as well. But I, yeah, in short, what I'm trying to say is yeah, exactly. So whatever you're trying to get and you know uh, takes the image tools, just kind of like go back one step and then you know change one keyword and then the results are gonna change uh, quite a bit. Thanks. So with that, uh, I'm gonna leave the you know stage to Diego and he's gonna show us how to morph between uh, or how, how to tween between images and create latent space uh, kind of you know um, image stacks. All right, so I will share my screen in a bit. I will leave uh, a link because we're gonna use um, one specific, uh, I think uh, Anur already and Dana explained what Colab is, or do I have to dig a little bit on? Uh, we didn't spend too much time on explaining what it is. We just, you, we literally imported the file and just run it, run all, you know, we didn't go even step by step. So what you Perfect. can do is you can also show like how to open the file and, you know, uh, just, just run through somebody who's starting from scratch. That would be great. Everybody has Colab now already. So that's, that's wonderful. 
Perfect. That's great because we're going to use the the. Um, just let me uh, accommodate my screen, and I will share it. Um, can you see my screen? All right. So, um, again, this is a very simple implementation of uh, of um, stable diffusion. Diego, Again, what, one, yeah. one quick request. If you could scale things up a little bit, it would help tremendously. Like that? Um, maybe go to, yeah, this is much better. Perfect. Okay. So Google Colab, um, for, uh, if, if you don't know what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a platform uh, from Google that uses this format that is called uh, Python Notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and the difference with like a typical script is that it allows you to uh, execute little chunks of code in a specific cells. So this is why the code looks like this. If you have seen like a Python code or like any um, a script, for example, even like in Grasshopper, for example, it's always just like a bunch of lines of code commented or not, whatever. Here you, you have, usually you have like an explanation, you have a text, a text cell, and you have instructions. So what is happening here is that each of these instructions are, are calling different functions and are executing different uh, tasks, let's say, right? So you will see sometimes, and I mentioned this like very quick to, to, to move to the, to the other uh, collab that we need to use now. Uh, you have, because this is running on top of a, of a Linux uh, virtual machine. So basically we're connecting to a server at Google that is using Linux. So this is why we can, use GPU and, and, and use basically all this computational power for free, or uh, if you pay like 10 bucks a month, you can use uh, faster GPU. So uh, again, the way that this works, you just start like sequentially executing by one by one. One of the things that, that uh, Onur and Dana share was an IPython notebook. So what you wanna do, actually, I, I don't have it in this computer, so I will just uh, save it really quick. Um, let me put this here. So let's say you just enter um, collab. And the first thing that you will see is a window, is, is a window like this, right? So it will show you what are your like recent collabs. You have some examples. You can uh, upload things from your Google Drive, but you, you can also upload uh, IPython notebooks or, or Jupyter notebooks, right? So you can, go here to upload, choose file, and select the Jupyter notebook that you have in your computer. So and Diego, also, uh, yeah. I think we have the EAC Tech 2020 film, TensorFlow. Is this the, exactly the same thing or, yeah, okay. So for that's everyone, the one, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the one that we will use, but also I will share a, a link. I will share like, I will show another way of, of using this in case you want to share, for example, a collab okay. with another person. So do, you, do you want people to open this file now to kind of like move forward with you, what we have, or just for <laughs> everybody to get hands of the experience? Or do you want to go first and? No, I, I'm just showing that when you open, basically it, it, will, it will show up here, right? Okay. Everything that, that, uh, that is written in the Python notebook. So you can just execute it. One thing that it will be very important for the implementation of, of of the frame interpolation that we are going to make, is that you want to make sure that if you go to edit notebook settings, and we will do it, you have here in hardware accelerator a GPU selected. We will go through it, but I, I will show you how to do it. So again, what um, what Onur and Dana show you, uh, it's a very simple and fast implementation of um, a stable diffusion, where you can just change the prompt here, play a little bit with the parameters and change the batch size. How many images do you want? And you can generate something, for example, here, a space station in a Saturn moon or something like that. Um, at the same time, if you wanna generate more images, there is a function here that allows you to do that. Uh, and the images will appear here and you can just like save image and download them to your computer. Um, so that's that's like a, like a very brief explanation. So now, 
How do we use this? We're gonna we're gonna use this uh, frame interpolation for long motion. Um, it's it's a it's a code. It's, it's something that was just uh, released a couple of months ago by um, Google people and Google research and people from the University of Washington that uh, usually like to interpolate or uh, between two images, right? It's very difficult. So this algorithm is very good because it allows you to interpolate between two or more images that have, have like a similar structure. So the results are very uh, appealing in terms of, 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 of the visual right, outcome that, that you get. Usually when you see like frame interpolation, uh, I don't know if you're using, for example, Adobe Premiere or DaVinci Resolve or Final Cut, the way that they do it is just like a, 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 some sort of like blending, like fading, uh, or using, for example, like optical flow, where they try to guess more or less like the flow of the information so you can blend between two images. So in this case, it's using a, a, a different approach. It's using um, a actually a diffusion model. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's a technique, a diffusion model is a technique that where you add uh, noise constantly to, to an image and then you denoise it to create new content, right? So the image basically is like getting um, uh, noisier and noisier, and then the computer, based on a prompt, learns how to denoise it. So in this case, it's using a similar technique that that uh, the the stable diffusion is using, just to create new information between two images, and that's what we are going to use. So, how do we use this? One of the 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 ways that you can use this collab and this technique that I will show you some results in a, in a second. Um, is by doing exactly um, what I just showed you before. You can go to File, um, Open Notebook, Upload, and upload the file that was uh, provided. Right? That is one way, and it will immediately uh, appear here in your collab window. The other way, in case you had problems, you don't have the file, when you have a cola file, you can always share it. And that's what I will do now with you. I will send you directly a code and you will see this. And this is probably like the best way to, to share cola files. So this is why I'm putting more emphasis on, on, on this type of, um, uh, let's say technique or method, right? Diego, so if you, yeah. Every, everybody's getting impatient and they're like, we want the file, we want the file. Could you, could you just send the file in the chat so everybody can now, follow through? Yeah. So. Go. Uh, you press share and you see this, anyone with the link, you just copy the link. And now, magically you just see the call app. You, you see that if, if you click here, you will go to the call app uh, where you have the frame interpolation using film. Now, one thing that I recommend that you do don't run everything uh, immediately. Just go to File, uh, save a copy in Drive. Because right now you're you're running an instance of this collab, but if you want to keep it in your files, in your collab, your own collab, just create a copy. You will see that uh, it will open another tab, and you will see that now you have a file that is called Copy of a AEC Tech uh, 2022 Film. So now. Uh, you will need a couple of things to make to make this work. You will need uh, two or more images that are the same size. So in this case, let me show you um, what I have here. I have a couple of images of just like, they were generated with stable diffusion with different prompts, like a, a cube, like a lattice cube, like hand drawing. Then I have another image that is like a cube with a, a different texture. Uh, another triangulated cube, blue, and then just like another image uh, like that. So basically I have it, a, a sequence of images that kind of look alike. They are old and this is a recommended size. So this is why if you wanna try this, uh, I would recommend that you have all the images with the same, uh, the same size basically. And um, they don't have to be, like um, exactly this, uh, like uh, like, so you can interpolate with like several uh, several images, but 
uh, you will see that it always works better if you have things that, like the, the images that you're interpolating, they, they have like a similar structure, right? So the images that I show you here, this is so you can understand a little bit, this is merging two images of the same person. So this is why the motion that you can get is so smooth. So if you're gonna get like smoother results or like do transitions, hopefully the images have like a sim similar elements. That's what I, I wanted to say. So I will show you, once you have your images, just save them in a, in a folder. So for example, here I will show you, um, I have this here. So for example, here I also have a couple of images that I just did in, uh, just to show you like another result in, uh, in Rhino for images. All the same size, I will keep them there. I have these images that I show you uh, before and I will upload them to, to my, my folder. So you, if, if we go through like all the steps, the first thing that you wanna, that you wanna do is uh, connect. If you, if you see here, like reconnect. Um, yeah, I have another thing open. So I'm just connecting to, to Colab. So you see here that some files, like a random folder appears. And now we're ready to start uh, running our film. Again, I will check one second. I have the GPU enabled. So remember, if you go to edit, notebook settings, hardware accelerator. Um, in this case, you see, I have more options because I'm, I'm, I have, I'm running the Google Pro version. So it doesn't matter if you can select GPU, you're good to go. And the first step is to verify that we're using GPU. So we're running this cell that has an, a command that is NVIDIA SMI. And you can see here that we are using, in my case, I'm using a Tesla T4 GPU, kind of old but very powerful to do what we want to do. And we're- Diego, yeah. let, let me jump in for a second. You know, we, because we were trying to run the, uh, you know, stable diffusion locally, at that moment, we discussed about having, you know, NVIDIA GPUs, but that was for your computer. What Diego is talking about is what Google is giving you on the cloud to use. So you don't really need any GPU, uh, like a beefy GPU on your machine. Yeah, you, you, can, you can run this from, from your phone if you want from an iPad or wherever. That, that is the, the advantage. Uh, so you can see that we're using, we are allocating space or GPU power in the Google server. Uh, we have 16 gigs of video RAM, so that is more than enough. Second step, and this is very important, we need to mount our Google Drive. So I am logged in with my Google account so I can uh, just run this cell. So if the execution of the previous cell was successful, you will see this check mark. Now I will do this and you will see that there is a, a, a notification where I have to give permission to call up to connect to my Google Drive. So I click connect to Google Drive. I select my, um, my, my user. Usually if you're connected again with your Google account, you want you don't have to put your password you just need to confirm the authorization in my case i'm doing that i will allow google drive to be mounted or connected here so it depends on the the amount of files that you have in your google drive this might take like 30 seconds or roughly like a minute like in my case and this is again you will see your a folder here on the left side of the screen that has your google drive while this is doing uh, this step I will explain the, 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 the next one. Actually, it just finished. So if I refresh here with this uh, button, you see that I have a folder that is called G Drive. So we're ready to actually start now installing things. One of the things that um, we want to do now is install the dependencies, all the libraries that we need and all the, the files. And you will see that at some point, this will give you a, a notification that you need to restart your, your, your file. Uh, so we will do that. So this will take like 30 seconds, seconds more or less because it needs to install like a different version of TensorFlow and add-ons and things that are necessary for running this. So I will just execute it. It's just uh, downloading the necessary things. So, I mean, the, the instruction here is pretty clear. So you see that in the, in the, um, 
console is showing that it's just installing more and more things. Um, the good thing about Colab is that it, it, it is pretty straightforward. So you just need to execute things and hopefully it will work. Um, it will say that yes, some requirements are already satisfied. And I just wanted to show me, um, so it can show me like um, the notification here to restart. It will take just a couple of seconds. Yes, here. So you see right now it's, it's saying that there are some incompatibilities with the version that we just installed of like some dependencies. So the only thing that we need to do now, after this happens, you will see this in, this is remember the, the third cell, the step three. If you go down, 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 you will see this restart runtime. If we restart the runtime, it's fine. Just say yes. And we execute this cell again. So now it will try to reinstall things it already did. And the, the one that it couldn't install basically now is, is there. So we don't have any errors or any warnings. So again, just run it once, see the restart runtime button at the, at the, at the lower part of the, of the console, and then just run the cell again. So now we have everything installed. And the fourth um, step is we need to clone the repository. So the code for, for this film, um, for, for this frame interpolation for large motion, that it works really well with videos, uh, it's, it's here, it's in GitHub. So basically it's, it's, a, it's a, again, a repository where people upload the code so you can use it or you can modify it, uh, contribute and so on and so forth. So in this case, with this commands, uh, git clone, we're copying everything to our Google Drive. So if you see here for a, for a second, so you see that this is the path where uh, we are saving the film uh, repository. So it will go to my Google Drive, a folder that is called film and frame interpolation, or actually film, and it will download everything there. So I will just run this and it takes a second. It's really fast. How do I know that I have this already downloaded. If I go to G drive, my drive, you see like all my folders and I have one folder that is called film frame interpolation and you will see that there are files here. So you will see something uh, pretty similar to this. The other way to do this is that if you go to your uh, Google drive, your own Google drive, uh, if you go to folders, I have, you see here, film, frame interpolation, and I can see this. So this is all the, these are all the files that are in this GitHub repository. Pretty good. The next step is downloading the pre-trained models. So they already pre-trained Right, a large model that can allow, that uh, will allow us to to do the interpolation with a lot of images. Um, so we will use that. We don't need to train anything. We will just like do inference, so basically extract or generate new information. So to do that, we just uh, um, again uh, press play. It takes nothing, like basically like a, a couple of seconds or one second. And we have a couple of options here. So you will see here an option to make a new folder where we can put our images. But actually, uh, I, I like to do this from, in, in another way. So we can skip this cell. We don't need this. Uh, what we want to do instead is uh, execute the, the next uh, cell where we can see that we have a lot of options. I mean, this is optional again. Uh, this will run the file, the frame interpolator, and it shows you all the arguments or parameters to run the file. So you need to specify like how many frames per second do you want to generate, how many images between 
your input images do you want? So how many interpolations and so on and so forth. So this, this thing, the only thing that it's doing is showing us like the, 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 all the possibilities or, or the options that we have to run this file. So now, once after we do that, this is the main part of, of the film repository. We are ready to interpolate images. And here we need to do a couple of things. So I recommend uh, that if you, you follow everything and we can answer some questions uh, uh, next to this while, while we generate our images, uh, what I like to do is uh, just go to my Google Drive where I downloaded the film frame interpolation, go to photos and here I can create a new folder. For example, um, actually, let me just do this uh, again. Let me just erase all of this. So let's say I just created a inside the photos folder, AEC, I created a folder named Q. So if you just go here to new folder, you name it, whatever you want. Um, yeah, it will, yell at me because I, I have two of this with the same name. So you create your folder and then you just upload your images directly. So I can go to my computer. These are my stable diffusion created images. I just drag them to Google Drive. And again, this is the advantage of mounting your Google Drive because you can, in, you can interact uh, faster downloading and uploading files. So I have all the files required here. Hopefully you want to, I mean, it's, it's desirable that you have your, your, your files with a consecutive uh, naming system. So here, like all the images are like one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a question. Where can we get the cube images? Um, I can upload them actually to, to the share folder. Actually, let me do that immediately. Um, should I put them in the demo files, uh, Onur? Uh, put them actually, uh, where do you have that uh, oh. call lab file? Ah, image morphing. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly, just, just there. Yep. Demo images. So that image morphing in call lab is, uh, are the files that Diego is showing now. So the images will be there as well. Yeah, so let me just Perfect. upload them here. Uh, you can find the images now, so good. So again, because I, I upload them to this, uh, not this one, let me go back to my folder here, the AEC cube. If I go back to my collab and if I go to the folder, you see film, frame interpolation, photos. And if I go to the folder AEC and cube, I can see, is it showing me the right? Yes, it's showing me here the images that I just uploaded, right? So I can double click and the image will appear here. So I can see them here. And this is very important because now the only thing that you need to do is to adjust your parameters. Um, one trick to actually get this, this, this path where we have the input images to interpolate is go to the folder. So I'm in the, uh, uh, with my cursor on top of the folder, right click and you do copy path. And then you just paste it here in this text block where it says folder. See, it, it, it basically this is like the, 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 the folder structure where my pictures are. So I'm using that one. Here, these are parameters that we need to use like carefully. Uh, in this case, we have, uh, it says like the higher the value, the longer the video. I will recommend for like demo to try uh, for the first time, no more than five times the interpolation. Um, and uh, you can set this from, I don't know, like zero to 60 frames per second. Like a very smooth video, for example, it will have 60 frames per second. So these are the, the amount of 
interpolation steps to generate, uh, again, like uh, a, uh, for example, in this case, like a 24 frames per second video. Um, so you see, we, I have the folder, I have the parameters. So now I just need to run this and hopefully it won't give me any error. It might give me an error. Uh, so you see that it's running TensorFlow. This is a, 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 a specific uh, deep learning framework. It will take uh, roughly like a minute, I think, to generate all the interpolations. Um, we just need to make sure that this doesn't like stop uh, working. If we so see that can this you see again the parameters five and you said five in, uh, times and what is the FPS? So the FPS th this will create a a video, right? So it will create a video between all the images. Yeah. So um, basically, it would create is is the amount of frames per second that we will generate. So normally any any video, any film you watch on YouTube, let's say the standard is between 25 to 30 frames per second. That's what most of the cameras work, you know, like the phones and, you know, uh, and 60 is an overkill most of the time, but in 60, you don't see blurs, right? So it's kind of like this fast image processing. So if you want to make a, you know, convincing and like unbreak video, right? So it should be around like, at least 24 frames per second, 25. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know, like if you're experimenting, I, I would go with 10, for instance, right? Start there and then make your way up to 30. Yeah. So you see that now I see the check mark. So that means that my I, I finished running everything. You see like a lot of information here, but the last lines, you see like the last three lines is like generating. Now the up, output frames were saved to the folder where I had the images and also it saved a video. So let's see what, what is the result. So if I go again to my Google Drive, I see that now I have, let me update this. So I have my five input images. I have a folder, interpolated images, but also I have the interpolated MP4 file. That is the video. Uh, it says that it's processing the video. It doesn't matter because I already downloaded it before. Let me just open it. And I'm almost done because I don't know how am I doing with time. But uh, yeah, so I have the video here downloaded. So you can see that the interpolation is really, it's, it's great. You can see, I mean, one thing that I like about this is that you can, you, you see how, uh, because the images again are, are cubes, the, the, the structure of the image is like pretty similar. You see like how uh, one image starts like eating or contaminating the other one. And you can see like intermediate steps that are pretty interesting from a from aesthetic point of view. So you go from this like hand drawing or something that resembles like a hand drawing to something that starts like being, I don't know, populated with something green that could be used for, for for something. Um, I have other examples. Uh, this is, for example, with the images that I took from Rhino. You see that the interpolations are great. You can play, for example, like changing colors, changing shape. These are not uh, stable diffusion generated. It's, it was just another example that I wanted to show you. Um, here I have the same, yeah. For some reason it doesn't show me, well, I'm using Windows, so doesn't show me the last frame, but the, the results are, are pretty interesting. We have some, you're getting an error. Okay, what does it say? Uh, say model file does not exist at do, 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 while running process. Okay, so let's see what that error might be. So, um, oh, one thing before we check the error so we can, be done with this. You have the video, but also you have the individual images. So this is pretty nice because you can, uh, you have all the frames in between. So again, it works really well, like really, the, you get like really interesting results when the images, the, the content of the image structure is more or less like similar. If you're trying to, I don't know, go from a building to a dog, probably that won't 
have like very good results uh, or, or maybe it, it will have like weird results. So if you're getting this, let's, um, the crucial uh, part is this one when you, where you download the pre-trained files. So for some reason, I will do one thing. I will erase my film. I will try to recreate the error. Did so anybody get you... too many too many command line command line arguments? Do you know what that points out to Diego? Sorry? Too many command line arguments. Yeah, these are these are just tests to to download like in different ways the, the model. So let me see if, if this works. Um, Again, so I will start from step four. So I'm just creating again the film uh, folder. I just clone the repository. And if I do the step five, yeah, uh, what I would suggest, so you see, you, you need to see this. It, this will download a, a 900 plus megabyte file. So what I did, in case you're, you're getting the error, I just deleted from my Google Drive the film uh, folder, and I executed the cell, the step four, because the step four, what, what it's doing is, um, it's checking if I have already the, the folder created. If not, it creates the directory again, and it downloads the repository again. So once we do that, if we execute the next step, it will again check if we have the file. Probably that was the that that was that might have been the 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 the, the error that you're getting. Uh, it will download the um, the weights of the model to the right um, location. That is this one. Frame interpolation, pre-trained models, and you should be good to go. And then again, remember that we can skip these two cells because these are just to you know what the, the possibilities of the file are, or if you want to create like another folder, we just need to go to this uh, part. So let me know if it's working for you. Uh, on my side, I think that's it. And then for, for, for the next uh, part of the exercise, you can download the um, the images to work with um, with uh, with with Anur. So if you have any questions, yeah, let, let me know. Let's play a little bit with this. Um, Did you say to go back to step three, like run the step three, the dependencies should we? No, the, the dependencies will be okay. will be okay uh, because if I you don't deleted, see, I just deleted film, for example. Yeah. So if you delete if you delete the the um, the, um, the folder in your Google Drive, you need to run step four because if you don't see anything like red or like a warning here, you're good to go. If you see that there is a problem here uh, that it says like restart runtime, if you press that. No, it's fine. It's, it's fine? fine? Okay, yeah. so then if you run uh, a step four, after you deleted the film uh, folder, you should see um, the, uh, let, let's say like a fr fresh installation of, of the repository. And then step five, it will re-download the weights that are the, it's basically like the train model. So it's, a, it's this file that we have here, um, this file that is pretty, it's, it's a big file. Um, so let me know mm. if, if anyone, if it worked for, for, for any of you, let me know if it's not working for anybody also, let me know. Well, let's, let's get this done because I mean, done meaning running because I got some errors and I'm trying to, I'm just trying to use the supplied files, you know, the kid pictures, there are two pictures. Yeah, and not changing the numbers, so that might be a good way to understand. We're running the steps four and five. Fix the error for me. Okay, that's great. Yeah, Somebody that's. That. And let me see if I got that too. So 
So in the meantime, if when you if you do that, um, I don't know. Did, did you show Lexica on her? Nope. So there, there's a very nice, I mean, if you're producing images, um, there's a very nice uh, website called lexica.art, lexica art, that has, a, it's the stable fusion search engine. So let's say you want to generate like any type of content, but you don't know where to start. You can start exploring, you can see that most people pr produce faces. These are uh, images generated for, for, for from other people. Um, so let's say, okay, this church. If you if I if you click on an image, this is very nice because you can find the the prompt that was used to generate that image. Sorry, you can see the prompt. Um, you can copy it so you can use it. But at the same time, it gives you other parameters that if you're using, for example, the, the web UI interface that Onur show uh, in the morning, you can reuse the seed. Basically the seed is a number that will generate a specific number and you have other parameters like the guidance scale. So uh, how, how strong do you want the algorithm to follow the prompt, for example, things like that. Uh, so you can see like variations, but another very interesting thing about Lexica is that you can explore something that is uh, more or less closer to the same style. So if you click on explore this style, uh, now you will see populated the, the, the website with similar images. So you can, uh, again, this is, I think, a very useful uh, resource. So you can start like playing with, uh, uh, your stable diffusion uh, in collab or locally. Uh, sorry, so, Diego. Yeah. The images that we put on in the file inside photos, in the folder inside photos, do they need to be something specific? Do we specify that? Uh, no, you can use like whatever image uh, you want. The PNGs, JPEGs, anything. Yeah, PG or, or um, PNGs or JPEGs are fine. I, I didn't try with bitmap. Um, uh, one thing that you need to, for example, if I want to use images from here, from Lexica that I just showed you, when you try to save the image, they, it saves the images in, in a WebP format. That won't work. So yeah, just make sure that there are JPEGs or PNGs. And you will be you will be good to go. Uh, Christina, are your images being read by the notebook or not really? Before, yeah, they were there. The images were there. It's only the MP, the, the video that is not uh, being. They are not being generated. Yeah. What What about yeah. you, Anur? Is Is it same, working for you now? Same. It's weird because I'm using the default. You know, I got. Another error, now I got another error. It's saying OS error for some reason. Okay. The save file does not exist at da, 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 da. So it's let, not let saving. Me, let me try because I have a, um, yeah. That is also important. Uh, you want, to, but you're using my. Uh, yeah, the folder. So it will yeah. save everything and, and in the default folder. So um, yeah, I changed that. I, I just you know got my directory and okay. Let, let me try with with the with the photos that come with the um, with the re uh, repository. So because just... yeah, like what you change on there right now is affecting everything, right? So you just kind of like change that and you're golden. Yeah, exactly. It it yeah. it, so it, it gives it you. Work. Let me see. Yeah, now it's giving me an error. So it says <laughs> file does not exist. Preaching so folder film. Ah, oh, okay, 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 okay. This is okay. this is a. Uh, now it's it's saying that it cannot find the pre-trained model. Now it's, it's it's telling me that it can it cannot find the pre-trained model. So yeah. let's fix that. Kind of so model path. This is weird. Oh, yeah, okay. Go yeah. Okay. Go ahead. That's fine. Sure. So once you run the, yeah, a way to fix this, sorry about that, because I, I don't know why it's happening now. Well, after you run the, the, the step five, 
you will see the, the zip file that we have here, the pre-trained model uh, that zip. So if I go to uh, my film, for some reason it's saving the pre-trained models outside. So you see, so what I can, what I need to do, you see, this is the frame interpolation folder and I need to have the models, not the models here, sorry, the, do, 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 not the data sets. Let me check what the, the call up is saying. Um, do, do, yeah, do, what, do. what I was, I just was like, let's take five minute break as Diego yep. is looking into it. So let's take five and be back at 320 and we see if anybody gets it done. If not, we will deliver it later. So you're gonna be able to make animations and I'm gonna show an animation example anyway. So this was a way for you to kind of, you know, interpolate images and I'm sure Diego is gonna solve it in five minutes. So let's take five and get back. Thank you. This is the problem.
All right. Good news, bad news, no news? Good, good news. It was just, uh, I was, <laughs> because before I, I the, it. yeah, but it's just like a silly thing. Before the, um, mm -hmm. the session, I was playing with this um, and I modified something in the code, but it's the, the only, the, I mean, the way to fix it, uh, you mm -hmm. see that the after you run cell, the mm -hmm. step, uh, the step four, mm -hmm. this will this will put, uh, and and I show it before the mm -hmm. the break, uh, in the film um, folder, it will put the pre-trained models. Pre-trained so models, the, yes. Yeah. So you, you just need, need to pull that, move it inside the film uh, folder. No. In the frame interpolation folder. Yeah, the frame. Sorry, the frame interpolation uh -huh. folder. Got it. So it was. Let me replicate the the error. Yeah. So you will see something like this in your Google Drive if you're getting the error. I just moved something in the code. I will fix it now. Following, you just need to drag this inside the frame interpolation, run it again, and and it will work. So actually, it just. I just uh, use it again with the with the example, um, the example pictures. Yeah, so you see it it generates a very nice. This is very good actually, and this is I mean, uh, if you for example have like footage like video, and if you want to make it like a slow motion, like super slow motion, mm -hmm. you can use this and, and you can have like really slow motion video. It works really well. Yeah, so um, you can bump the frame rate to 100 and something, right? So it, it generates yeah. crazy amount of frames. Because are, it, mm -hmm. look at that. I mean, it's, it's, it's interpolating like perfectly between those yeah. two example photos. So you only want the interpolation, nothing else, nothing more. Sorry, you can only, you repeat? You only, you only run the part that says we are now ready to interpolate. Yeah, you can do that. If you get another error, I'll, I suggest that you you run everything from step three. If you get that, like yeah. another error, Christina, that's what I did. Run run it from step three, and yeah. then, okay. then then it's gonna work. So yeah. the uh, anesthesia asked what the error was. So once you install. In the film folder, there are two folders. Yes, as you see, Diego, could you zoom into that again? Yes. Uh, those, those two two folders. Okay. So what I think she to... also asks just uh, to interfere with like how we can fix it without moving it afterwards. Oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna fix that now in the code and reshare that the the okay. call up with you. It's just here, yeah. like a like a, my my bad with the okay with the with the code. Okay, so yeah, it it got interpolated. So let's try this. Uh, okay. Do you want to fix it now, or do you want to fix it and send it so I can keep moving, Diego? What do you want uh, to do? You you can keep moving, so so All I right. can I can yeah. I can send it. Yeah. Yeah, so let me do this here, new photos. Let me two. stop sharing my, my screen. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to share now. Uh, so probably that error that is like uh, you're getting there is because this is the free version of Colab and probably you're bumping the parameters a lot. So it's trying to generate yeah. a lot of images. I will suggest yeah. you interpolate maybe like three times and reduce it to like 20 frames per second um, because it's you're using more memory than, than that allocated. So you see, it, it, if you see your, your message, it says like allocation of 1769 and you have <laughs> only 16 gigs of, of, of video. Yeah, uh, I you're see trying to use it. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I got I got something similar to I tried to run, you know, uh, with multiple images and because I was trying to use too many images, uh, started getting that problem. Okay, let's go back here and let me let me open the files. 
All right, so this is good. The only thing is we won't have much time for it to see your exploration. So my request from you would be staying in touch and you know, like anything you play with, just send it to us. And if you do cool stuff, you know, we'll be happy to share it like, you know, uh, online, you know, over Instagram, blah, blah, just tag us and we're gonna reshare it. Uh, let us know what you get excited with. That's really important for us. So if you're getting some excited with some of the stuff that we are showing here, we would definitely would like to follow up. Okay. Uh, cool. So at some point I got, I got a little mad uh, in a good way, not in a bad way with data stuff in uh, mid journey. And actually that is the, that is, I think what uh, influenced me uh, in, uh, you know, offering this workshop. So just to, this is like, take this as closing remarks for today too. And we're gonna do one last thing and then we're gonna be done. So one thing I ended up doing was um, just, you know, like it's it's always like, I, I always try to uh, differentiate, you know, creating meaningful designs to just like, uh, instead of, you know, uh, creating a hype and, you know, like uh, jumping on the bandwagon, if you will. Actually, the first images that I did with Mid Journey was uh, bandwagon. And I shared that post on LinkedIn saying that, hey, okay, for everyone, we had parametric design 15, 20 years ago. Now it's the, you know, text the image stuff so you can jump in. But I was, I got curious, right? So what I did though was uh, just, you know, getting these. Um... If you're a college student, keep watching. One of my least sure. favorite things about writing papers in college was remembering the correct yeah. format. For Thank you. Okay, college is Essentially, gone. I don't think uh, much has changed. Okay, so the first thing I was trying was just, trying to see the parameters and what they do and how you can try to tame this thing. Okay, so if you're interested again about mid journey, each of these videos, and I was visualizing like data, like data painted on car. And the numbers you see here is data is one, car is 12. So it's the weights of what you wanna see. You know, you can change the weights and then the result would change. Okay, so this is actually like in each of these uh, videos, if you go to the description, I think, yeah. So there's a PDF here and you can download the PDF and, you know, like read what's happening. You can apply these and uh, uh, mid journey and, you know, like understand how things are working. So you can kind of like control that. So that's one. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was just kind of like, you can also use these for you know, how to, how to determine your path for like creative purposes. So that's like, this is, this is, the, this is that, which is showing divergence and convergence in, in design. So how to use these AI tools. Uh, and then, you know, at some point, uh, so as I was painting cars with data, I was like, okay, let me use data flux. So these are the, these are the outcomes. Interestingly, so mid journey is very biased. Uh, I, I talk about that too, you know, like I have a couple of posts about that. And it's okay because, you know, it's supposed to be biased because there's a data set, somebody picked those or a group of people picked those images to train the, you know, uh, the model, uh, the AI algorithm. And it's really natural that, you know, it's biased. And, you know, we discussed this, like whatever you say, for instance, you can say superhuman flying into the sky, blah, blah, you get same color gradient. And you see like data in flux, same color gradient, you see, this car, that car, you get like the default is always the same. So if you want to change it, you need to play with that. But then as I was playing, you know, I was kind of like pushing the prompts a little more and then started seeing these things, which which got me like super intrigued. And, uh, you know, I think one powerful thing about mid journey is prompting is really important, like how you prompt, how you craft your prompt is really important. But beyond that, like you're running generations and generations and generations of, you know, uh, images like making versions in mid journey is, uh, is pretty amazing because it's letting you, uh, you know, uh, it, the algorithm gets pushed out of the boundaries, I would say. So it keeps kind of like sampling from different vectors from the latent space. So the, just making variations is helping you, you know, 
explore what other vectors may appear. And actually, as I was looking at these, I'm like, oh my God, I missed this one, right? So it's just kind of like, I, I just didn't even see it while I was maybe being fascinated with the other images. So I did that and then I picked, uh, you know, a bunch of images and I was like, okay, these are really interesting. I told myself, it's really similar process, but it's more like a, uh, the manual process of making this. So I said, okay, this image is a, uh, and I always pick the images that are offspring of the previous one, right? So this is really a uh, lineage of, you know, images coming like after each other. So like the one image is giving birth to the other one and so on and so forth. So then I said, okay, I'm gonna merge them and manually in, in After Effects, uh, what you can do is, uh, Diego mentioned this uh, a second ago, so there are two ways of blending. One is fading in and out, which is the simplest thing, right? So the, the, the layers kind of like get blended. Uh, the other one is pixel motion. So try that in After Effects if you're using After Effects. Pixel motion is again, I think it's a very early maybe AI attempt that is trying to uh, see a structure in the image. And the structure here is quite different, right? So if I run these, um, frames through what Diego showed, I'm sure it's gonna already create uh, you know, better result. Maybe Diego, you can try this already because I have these images in the data flux folder in the images folder there. I mean, up to you, I tried to run it, I couldn't because there are too many. Uh, but anyway, right, so I did this, which is a, a byproduct of After Effects. But once you do that, uh, great, okay. So Diego fixed the code so we can go back to that later. Once you do that again, you can this time take this frame, uh, take this video, sorry, take this video. And then because this is 30 frames per second now, I filled in in between by using After Effects, right? So I can extract all these images. So then I went, you know, again, generated these kind of like, you know, uh, images frame by frame that video, I think I was skipping maybe five to 10 images, you know, per, per second. So that's like, uh, that's fine, great. And uh, and then you take these, uh, and you know you can create like three dimensional representations. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to show is this. Now let's Google. I think I'm going to find it somewhere here. Yeah, here. I think. Okay. So at some point I got this. Um, you know. A bit of funding to to work on this project, so it was a model of a drawing process. So what's happening is uh, there are a bunch of layers, and it's a spatio-temporal model of a painting that's that's a watercolor painting that you do with a machine, right? So you you paint, you capture, you project it, you paint it over it again. I'm not going to go into detail, but this is pretty much kind of like showing that development in space, right? So you kind of like explode the uh, explode the thing, and you know you have like these layers of temporal, you know, applications or representation of how that model came to life. All right, so that was it. And we can now do this by these kind of images, right? So we can kind of like take them into Rhino uh, using the image processing techniques that we have showed. And we can uh, try to see, you know, like what interesting, what kind of visualizations we can create. So this is zero. I haven't uploaded this, but I will upload it. Uh, so this was the first thing, right? It was very simple. Everybody saw this already. We have hedgehog, we have the image path, uh, we have the image size, and we have the multiplier for the image size. And then we have true post, are we running or not? Yes, we're making a box. We're making sure it's a mesh. And then we have the preview, that's it, done. So because you saw this already, I'm not gonna redo it again. Uh, and interestingly, okay, so what is happening here is that, so I'm gonna steal the first portion uh, of that script. Let's go with that. Let's go to zero, just, just to see that I'm doing the same thing exactly, not, not something different. So I'm gonna just copy this, go to version one and paste it here. So this is that, this is that code. Okay, what I'm going to do different is, uh, remember this was doing this, all right, so that's good. Let me close this. So what I'm going to do is I will, uh, instead of using this image, I'm gonna pick multiple images. So I can say select, select many files, 
And actually the files I selected were uh, these files. I can go here, copy, paste, uh, select all the files, consider that I did because it's in another location. I don't want to destroy it now. So I have the path. Then I have the length of that collection, which is uh, how many files I have in there. I said I have 64 frames already. And here I'm selecting the item. So out of 64 images, 69 images, I'm selecting one single image. And I know the pixel size of the images, the dimensions are width and height are 1024, right? My multiplier is one again, so I'm not changing the dimension. And uh, and then I'm, you know, instead of a box, I'm using a Weaver Bird pyramid just to keep things interesting. I mean, you can, you know, if you if you know Weaver Bird, it's uh, it's just creating this. Let me close that. Okay, so if you look into that, it's just this shape, right? So it's like nothing, nothing crazy, nothing out of the ordinary. It's just a parameter, and it's by default it's mesh. So once I create that, I see this, and remember what I was doing was I was putting preview and uh, custom preview for this one. And I can connect the geometry to the color and done, bam. So you see that the, this is the data flux image that we were looking into more or less. It's kind of hard to see. Let's go uh, shade it. Uh, don't die on me. Okay, yeah, I, I started getting this error for no reason yesterday. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's go render and let's not push it. I'm not gonna push it. So you see that it's kind of like sampling and you know creating this interesting image. I can change the size of the pyramid, which is like the base circle says five. So I can enlarge that to 10. Looks like a box, it's just kind of, okay. Now it's easy to see. All right, you got it. So this is the image. And then if I move the slider now from one zero to one, it's gonna change the image. Come in. And then if I move to let's say 17th image, just for you to see. So it's visible. I can slide this. So it's kind of like, okay, it's just doing it. So one nice thing now I can do is already um, I can say right click animate in grasshopper and I browse and I say whatever it is saving, I'm going to be okay. And I can say data flux. So this is 4K. So I'm rendering in 4K. Let me let me see where this is. Okay, now browse. Let's go to downloads. Ah, okay. So let's go to. Doesn't matter. Okay, okay, and then I'm gonna do 4K. I don't care. And frame count not 100. I have 69 images, so I'm gonna make 69 uh, files. And let me check the preview. So by default, this animator is looking for um, perspective view. So I need to change that, the view, 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 view port from perspective to top. And now I should be seeing my, yes, image. All right, so let's do that. Let's, let's take some risks and <laughs> just run this. So I'll say, okay. And it's going to, so you see this, it's slightly changing, generating frame seven of 69, eight of 69, one minute is left. And if I go to that folder here, let me find that quickly here, here, templates, down there. Okay, so you'll see that. I have the files being generated already here. So this is again, image from image from image from, you know, like to image to image and so on and so forth. Okay, so now you have something new. All right, that's great. So what we can do now is we could apply, you know, the size change by color as Dana showed. That's like no brainer now because it's, a, you know, just you just, you just use the uh, brightness value to determine how large a shape is. 
But what I'm interested in more is like kind of like just moving this thing up, you know, in space as we go through the frame. So it's not it's like a one dimensional animation, it's rather an exploded description of animation in its time space. So instead of like time moving as a slider uh, in the animation, you are moving the image, the, the frame of the video in space. So it's the, you know, like spatial temporal description of the video. All right, let's do that. Almost done. Okay, that wasn't too bad, no crash. And this is like 4K, you know, kind of like taking that rendering in 4K, so that's done. The animations that I showed you in um, in the Instagram channel, you know, they, they are like, they are V-Ray renders, most of them, but you know, they could have been done uh, this way as well. So I'm gonna just uh, save this file as uh, one, let's say session, because we did this during the session. So this is done. Let's go to the second one. Uh, you know what? For you to understand everything, I'm gonna go step by step. I'm gonna copy this here. Just take it to the second file. Oh, okay. So sorry. Like we should we should go back actually and uh, do this. You know how this kind of like filtering is happening. That's what's important. I'm a little worried about my display. Why this is like. I'm, Don't. Okay, maybe it's that. Yeah, it's that. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna restart uh, Rhino, and in the meantime, Diego, you fixed the code. Do you want to show us what's happening? Or what happened? I think Diego left. We can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry, I just lost communication for for a bit. Can you repeat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, I was asking what the problem was, so you could show us the error, and we, you know, oh. everybody can understand what was happening. Yeah, it was just it was just messing with the with the code a, uh, a little bit before, so the error <clears throat> was. Um, in this step, step five, um, <clears throat> here, so you understand what's what's going on. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna code it first because we're uh, in this a specific cell, we are running terminal commands. So we need to go to the path where we, um, where we want to put, the SIP file with the weights, weights, the free train model. So here we're just entering, we're just entering a terminal command and we're going to the frame interpolation directory. If it exists, that's fine. We just go one level, uh, um, we just return to the, to the main folder. If not, uh, if, it, if this is the data structure, we just download the the, um, the file, the zip file. We unzip it, but we unzip it being in the right directory that in this case is frame interpolation, film dash frame interpolation. And then we need to go to the um, uh, film, um, Folder. That that was it. I, I just I just messed it up. I for some uh, for some reason I just deleted that portion of the code, and it will work now. So okay, so it was the directories pretty much. Yeah, it was just a directory yeah. thing. How yeah. how do I know this? If if for example, if you try to run this cell here that mm -hmm. shows you all the helper functions, it will say that it cannot find uh, interpolation CLI. Because mm. you're not in the right folder. That's 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 it. it. Okay, perfect. Thanks, man. Okay, so let's let's continue with uh, with what I had, and I'm gonna keep it like uh, simpler. Okay, so what we are doing is we are doing some redundant stuff here, right? So like there are too many black pixels. They are not doing anything interesting. Blah 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 blah. So I can kind of like get rid of that. 
both save myself like computation time. Actually, the, the amount of darker pixels here is way more than the color pixels. So if I need a black background, I can add that later on, right? So what I'm going to do about that is I'm going to reduce the, the size first, just to make it a little more visible. Okay, let's make it eight. And if you don't have Weaver Bird, like, yeah, just replace this with a box again. Remember, we made a box here. So you can make a box. I'm oh, sorry, not that. So from the first file, we can make a box. And actually, in the other files, you already have it. So if you want to change that, do it. And then we can just generate a box. You're fine. You know, five, six. OK, let's go with this one. So what I'm going to do is now, uh, if we if we stop here for a second and just kind of like copy paste, just forget about this portion. So, you know, let's say we don't have that yet. All right. So what's happening now is I know there are cubes. I have 2,704 of them, right? So if I check them, they're all meshes, okay, cubes. I have their colors. And I know like there are too many black, you know, like zero, zero, zero pixels, which I don't want to see. And then I have the brightness, which is again for zero is black. And then it goes, you know, up to um, one, which is a pure white. All right. So what I want to do is I want to get rid of the dark pixels. So for that, I need a, um, I need a pattern like true, true. It's like, is it is going to ask me, do you want to keep this? I need a component like that. Okay. Do you want to keep it or not? And I'm going to say, depending on, hey, if it is darker than 0 0.3, that's the number I have there, or it can be 0 0.2, which is, a, you know, like, let's say, brightness level, uh, which is lower than 0 0.2. So anything between 0 and 0 0.2, I don't want to see that. That's what we're going to say. So it's going to say, false, 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 false. Do you want to keep it false? Do you want to keep it true? Yes, those are the bright pixels. So I am going to check if the number is larger than 0 0.3 or 2, right? So the, if it is larger, I want true, which means that if it is larger, keep it for me. So I'm gonna say larger. I'm gonna check this brightness value against this number. Okay, so I'm checking every brightness value and this component will tell me if the pixel is uh, brighter or darker than the level that I mentioned. So. Here you get like falses. So if I go to the top, I can, I'm gonna see lots of falses because those are all zeros, remember? Brightness zero. And they are not larger than 0 0.3. Okay, so I mean, you got this. I'm just kind of like explicating is a lot. All right, so I have a true false pattern, which I can use to filter out the ones uh, that are marked as false. So I can say call pattern. So calling actually is one of the best, you know, like, uh, I would say, you know, functionality in encoding anyway, right? So because you get rid of the redundant data that you don't want to deal with. And it's also perfect for kind of like segmentation, you know, like uh, making portions, uh, partitions and so on and so forth. So I'm going to say call pattern and pattern is the true post, post pattern. And what I need to call are the shapes because I don't want to use my computing power to for that many boxes. I just want, let's say, uh, if I do, if I close the preview here and select this, okay, this looks good now. All right, so it looks really good. Remember, I had the color info too. So, and I know here, instead of these 2,700 uh, boxes, I have uh, 629. So that's way less than half. It's, actually less than one third of the boxes. So computationally, we're already, you know, uh, making more than 66%, you know, uh, reduction uh, in the, uh, you know, the, the load that you're kind of like putting on the computer. So if I pull the color, would it work? So let's pull the, uh, let's try to make the preview for this one. So these are the geometries now, and those are the materials. And something is weird happening here. So. Something weird is happening here because the problem is, as I called the shapes, I didn't call reduce the number of colors because I'm trying to match, uh, you know, 600 something boxes to 2000 something colors. So actually I can use exactly the same calling pattern uh, to call the colors, okay? So I have similar amount of colors, true, false, true, false. And because they were already streamlined in Hedgehog, 
the boxes and colors, I can use that as my color. Done. All right. So now going back to my, okay, I can delete this part, which was exactly the same thing. You know, I just did this for, for the sake of describing. And I can change two things here. So I can, I can, I may want to see more darker pixels. So I, you know, push my slider towards the left and I start seeing like really dark, dark blues and towards black and bam. Okay, so finally you see, you see black because I, I pick not greater and equal to, I pick gr uh, greater. So there are purely zero pixels, which are not being shown. Okay, keep that in mind. And if I want lesser darker colors, I can push this to the, you know, to the extreme. And the other thing, nice thing is because I loaded 69 files and I was picking the item here, now I can do that. Exactly the same thing in a much faster fashion and just by using you know, the, 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 the meaningful data that I wanna use, like I don't wanna see the other stuff. So I can kind of like, again, do this. See, it's like way faster if I try to print this. Uh, yes, if I try to make the animation pr printing mean, meaning, uh, it would be much easier. So what I'm gonna do is I'll save this file, file, save as, so this is, V1 session again, V02. So I say you know, V02 of the V. Oh my God. Okay. It's C. I couldn't type it. That's fine. Uh, so what I'm going to do is again delete this, uh, get rid of the. Yeah, there's nothing redundant here. Maybe we don't need the panel anymore. So I'm going to copy this and go to my third file. So we can again track what's happening. Let's open. The third file, which crashed too. So let me open the recovery file. Okay. So things start a little like changing here. All right. So this is our previous file. We can immediately look into what's really happening. So what I'm going to do is what I'm trying to do is I'm going to close the preview for this and and close, of course, the, you know, preview for these. I don't want to see them. Great. So in perspective here, you're seeing already I'm stacking these images. Uh, okay, so this is what I was trying to do. So let's see how we get there. So the first thing I'm going to do is, again, you know, this is the solution we're seeing. So I'm going to select that and move to the bottom. And I'm going to use the latest thing that I did, which you have seen already, so you know how to do this. So let's go from this one to the final thing. So let me turn this off and let me get rid of the pyramid now. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Just use boxes as of now, make this visible. Uh, like this, okay, now we can see that we're in the fourth fourth frame. Let's go back to one and just organize it a little bit and save it. Okay, so here we go. So what I need to do here is, okay, remember I have all the images here already. So if I check the panel, oh, there are like 69 images here. That's ready to go, but I'm reading them one by one. So now I have to like build a loop, you know, in which this internal mechanism is working each and every, work on each and every image. And as I work on them, it moves kind of like, you know, in the Z direction. So to do that, uh, I know I have to graph things. So graph thing it means uh, you know you you create a um, algorithm, and you make it run uh, in you know like the layers of uh, data structure. So these are what you're doing is if this is a set, you know. Okay, let me get my let me get the best tool to you know explain this kind of stuff. So in the first one we had a set set A, and then you have like 69 of these images, right? So what we were doing is, okay, with the slider, pick one first, second first, third first, fourth first, fifth first, then, and so on and so forth, one by one. So whatever algorithm we were applying to this, we were applying like to, to one of these red cells. So what we're trying to do now in turn is more like that. This is like, again, the set A. Uh, but we want to define these cells already predetermined. Okay, so we're going to have those members again inside. 
But instead of running this as like one single channel, we want to do this. Okay, so we are changing the data structure. So what's going to happen is instead of like this going one by one, either this or that, it's going to kind of like apply to all of them. And then we are going to instruct all of these to move in different levels. Let's say Z0, Z1, Z2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so then we are going to get this kind of like stacked image fashion. So paint is the best, as you see, programming and modeling interface. Great. With that out of the way, uh, to, to do that, uh, I know the first thing I need to graph this, you know, segregate as uh, the path because instead of one, I want to have 69 images. That's kind of dangerous, if you ask me. So what I'm going to do is this, and it, because it was dangerous, I used eight here, right? So here you can see eight files. So I'm going to just, just copy that. So bear with me. Imagine you're just picking you know, eight files instead of 69 files. Let's copy and paste this too. That's the first thing I'm changing here. See? Oh. Uh, why don't I see no data? This contains eight. No, nothing in that either. Okay. Well, I can do this. I can say path, select many existing files, go back to my, go back to my, let's see, data in flux and just pick the video frames. Great, so what I'm gonna do is just pick them vertically so it, it makes sense as a sequence, okay? So I'm not duplicating. I think I picked enough many, so maybe seven of them now. Let's see how many. Well, select many existing files. One, two, three, four, five, open. Oh my God, somebody should have told me, you, I locked the, I like the software and nobody's telling me. Oh my God, okay. Eight images, back to eight. Oh, oh I don't know how I locked the solver. Sorry, trying to go a little fast. And I need to just right click here in the path and just graft it. But before I do that, I don't want my you know definition to explode. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sample way less, you know, pixels, lesser number of pixels. Okay, so I have much smaller uh, sampling uh, resolution. And then I'm gonna graph this, oh, graph. It's gonna get a little bit confused because what I'm doing is I'm graphing this. This is now, uh, and of course I don't need one item, right? So now I'm getting all the images here, okay? So this is dead, it's not being used because I want all eight, I'm feeding them, good. Okay, I have eight channels here. So I have like multiple channels out already partitioned in the way I want, but everything is in the first level. So it's not doing what I'm trying to do. So, but the culling is working. So I think, I think it's fine for now. So I need to figure that out. What I need to do is this. Uh, I need to find a way to move each image cluster, each image press, processed image, the, the group of boxes in the Z direction as I described. So let's try to do that. Okay, so one thing I need for that is, hmm, I need the, the length. This is the, you know, the length of the collection. Length means how many items I have in a set. So that's the set length, you know, the, the collection length. So I'm gonna make a series of numbers using that. Okay, serious. So if I start at zero, and if I go with step one, and if I go, use like eight numbers, I'm gonna have this. So it's a series of numbers that start at zero and go to seven, which is eight, you know, uh, eight numbers, eight units, pretty much. Okay, and then I can use that to move, you know, each, let's say, image, uh, processed image as, you know, collection of boxes and so on and so forth. And I know that that's happening here, somewhere here. So these should be the, uh, the geometry being called and so on and so forth. Okay, so how can we do this? I know I need to move them in Z, so let's let's create move. And I know that I need to create a vector in Z to move these um, boxes. So let's say vector X, Y, Z. 
So this is the way I always like find the, you know, because I probably, because I'm coming from like scripting, you know, I just kind of like type the names and it's easier than going to these, you know, like icons and so on. So it's, it's uh, I think helpful for me to find those. Okay, for Z, I know that I'm gonna use uh, these series of numbers, zero to seven, ah, nice. Okay, now I have, now I have eight vectors. Yeah, I'm getting there slowly. The only thing I know is these were grafted. So if I don't graph this like that, data structures won't work. So if I need to do the same, I need to, you know, uh, treat the collections, the data and collections in the same way. So if I check this, I'm gonna see zero. I'm gonna see one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. And we're gonna go to seven, of course, great. And then we have seven vectors, which is organized data structures are exact. So, so this should work now. I'm hoping. Uh, so I'm gonna take the the geometry and I'm gonna move with that. Okay, so something happened, but it's weird. Well, what's happened is, okay, things moved as far as I can see, but I think they didn't move enough because I'm using only one X, like one unit to move things up. I can't change that. I know my box is six units tall. So if I multiply, my vectors by six, which is exactly that. So I can multiply the grafted vector with this number I'm using. So it adapts as I change it. So if I check this now, it's gonna be the same vectors multiplied by six and then move them. Well, something is happening. Okay, and then the last thing I need to do is just, <laughs> match the geometry with color. Yeah. My brain is a little burning, you know, like, okay, wonderful. So, so I got it. Of course, is they're still overlapping. The reason being, uh, it shouldn't be six, actually. First, I need to multiply that. Hmm, let me, if I, ah, of course. So I add my one more multiplier. And I say, actually, because the box is six, I need to go 12. So multiply by two. And if I go like this, hmm? no, oh, okay, it did it. Okay, perfect, done. And what I can do now is I can go back to my higher resolution of 10. And remember, because I attached that to the, you know, the Z high too, so I don't have to go back and modify. And because my resolution is low enough, I can go and go crazy with uh, select uh, many existing files. So I can kind of like do this and just on the side, try to get maybe these many images. I think I'm picking maybe 12. Let's see how many I have, hey, 11. Okay, so I got 11 files and this is kind of like the CAT scan, right? So if, if we were in MR, if we take this animation, and if we, if we put the animation in an MR machine, this is what we would see, right? So it's kind of like consecutively moving to other frame uh, as we move forward. Very good, uh, interesting. So I'm gonna again take, okay, before I take a risk, let me save this. By the way, you're still there, right? I don't hear anyone and I don't, I don't see anyone. So I'm hoping there's some people who are listening to me now. Yes, yes. no? Oh, or great, there. okay. Wonderful. It's it's so weird. I don't see anything. I'm just kind of like talking to myself in my room. So, which is uh, probably not too uh, healthy, but anyway. Okay, so this is saved. I can go bump this to one. Okay, so now it's doing like full sampling uh, and stacking the, uh, the images. Great, okay, done. Perfect, save this. Uh, and again, you don't need that like we solved it here. Again, just the session file. Actually, in the original file, you will see these versions, which is almost the same thing. Uh, but you know, just just to, just for the sake of it, I'm just going to save that uh, with those. And for this one, this was a session, so let's mark that in this way too. Okay, we are at finally at the last level, which kind of like merges what Dana did. Uh, which with distance uh, meshing and figuring out the distance by color distribution in space, which essentially is, again, if I go back to this guy, 
which uh, you know like everything you see on s1 was based upon that idea so what's happening here is exactly using uh strong guys chin wonderful nice muscles great okay so uh what's going to happen here is uh yeah this is exactly reading okay if we pause this for a second so we are reading the pixels here pushing everything uh according to uh the brightness values you can tell it here right so the white is at the top and the darker color is at, at the bottom so this was pretty much driven always with the you know like the brightness pushing the pixels up but at the same time using the logic that dana showed you know uh the extrusions kind of like they sometimes split apart because the points are not close enough or they are really close enough so that let's say if you have too many points in a dark area, darker area, you start seeing like the mesh faces and so on and so forth. So again, you know, like uh, it can, it might be an interesting challenge for you to, you know, kind of replicate this or get, get closer to what you're seeing on the screen by just starting with that. And I'm gonna show you the last tool, uh, which will help you get there. I know it's, it's the end of the day and I know uh, we're trying to finish it or 30, but I think this is going to be helpful for you if it doesn't crash. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so this one I am going to uh, do, you know, like what Dana did because we don't have much time to show that. So if you look at the final version of this, okay, it looks a little crazy. So let me go step by step. This is exactly what we did. You have seen this already, right? So if I open this, uh, turn this preview on and uh, do that, give me one second and just hide these. So Sorry, uh, Anwar, yeah. I have a question a little bit about yeah. that, exactly that. Like um, I missed uh, that point where they move according to, to brightness, no? uh this one no this one actually sticks by image it's that okay 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 okay, okay. then yeah, so okay it's like, so it's like image zero one two yeah. three four five yeah because this is something different than what i showed like in the video it's 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 using what i was trying to say is it's using hedgehog still but it's doing something completely different this is more like the you know uh, you take the video frames and you walk in space in Z. That's mm -hmm. it. Great. But Dana's before, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. In this Dana's before, it was according to brightness. Like we could Which see one? that in Dana, what she did at the very beginning, it was not yes. differentiating ac according to RGBs or SMIX, but no. it was all about brightness. Yes, exactly. Because she was using one single image, remember? She was using yeah. one single image and pushing the brightest pixel to the highest point, which, mm -hmm. which is exactly the, the dancing video that I have, right? Yeah, technically. And, but this one is uh, keeping every image flat, actually, just making boxes. Okay, and then, okay. yeah, 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 it's making a layer cake. Actually, you can make a cake with this, right? So this is the, this is the interesting thing. Great. Okay, let's keep going. So I finished that, let me share my screen. Great. Okay, so the last uh, last bio is I think it's this one. Okay, great. So I'm gonna pick these, make everything invisible first, and then make this visible. So we keep going. Uh, yeah, there are. There, I mean, this is the sizes, and so are and are gonna be slightly different than the you know what I just did because it's a live session. So bear with it. But here's what I'm doing. So here I am going to find the center of each box. Okay, this is kind of simple, I hope. So I'm looking every, at every box and then I am taking the area, okay? of. So once you take an area and volume of objects in Rhino, it gives you the center part. So actually, if you are doing like volumetric design, you end up or voxels, you end up using this a lot because you need to find the center of those objects all the time. So I take the take the boxes, find the centers, great. And then I'm doing exactly what Dana showed, right? So I'm creating, let me kill these for a second. 
So I'm creating point volumes around those uh, points and I'm using dendro settings. So here is interesting. So what's happening is I know my box size, the pyramid is not there. So my box size primitive is 10. So the width should be around like 20. So if it is 10, 20 wide, I'm trying to get my voxel size, something around that, which is um, actually not that, but the dendro settings, which is like 15, right? So it's kind of like compatible, right? So if I go like super high resolution, we can try to push this a little bit. So let's go down to 10 because, you know, somebody was asking uh, what, Haley, if I'm not wrong, the name, I'm hoping I'm learning the right name. Ask about the speed. So I, if you reduce the voxel size, means you can spend spend more time. And let's reduce the how much the radius of that bubble is. Let's go down to fifteen with that. Okay. Now you see independent, uh, you know, um, bubbles. But in every layer, because these are these were grafted uh, layer by layer, it's going to join. Uh, those meshes in every image, but not between the images. So this is a pretty cool, you know, uh, meshing meshing method, I would say, because the the merging is happening in in within one image, but not between the images. So these are stacks, so they are kind of like separate but unified um, unified in each and every layer. So it's really kind of like creating this really cool, <clears throat> I would say, image. And the next step, so. Okay, in the next step, what I'm doing is I can union everything. So this will help me if I if I bake this for a second. Let's let's see what happens. Okay, and I, let me go to Arctic. No, oh no 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 no! Don't crash on me. Don't. Okay. I think I need to kill this again and then show it really fast. Sorry, I pushed it a little too much. But we are at the end, it's really, really done. So I think Diego uploaded the video uh, to the to drive. Um, yeah, it's in the folder of the frame interpolation. I, I did the interpolation with the, um, with all the, Frame the sixty nine images. It oh, looks really? pretty okay. good actually. Yeah. Can you show that? Can you show it for a second? Yep. Um, and in, in the in the meantime, I'm gonna open the. Let me see oh. which one is. I think it's not this one. This one. Can you see the? Yes. It's very slow. Probably we're gonna see it choppy. Oh, the quality looks pretty good. Yeah, let me nice. put it again because it, it was choppy at the beginning, but then. I think we're seeing it choppy anyway because the refresh rate and zoom is just probably we're seeing like. But, but it's, in the, frames. It's, it's in the share yeah. uh, file, so you can see it. It, it did a pretty good, good job, so. Great, thanks, man. Much appreciated. Let's finish this open recovery file. Okay, done. Mm. So this is done and I'm going to the fifth one, no, sorry, fourth one, recovery file, share the screen. <clears throat> so you can see the same black, <laughs> like screens that you left with, come on, do something. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to close that preview. I don't want to mess with anything else. And again, uh, you know, just make everything invisible. Let me close the third file because that was causing some trouble for me. Okay. So we have the volumetric points. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, play with it too much. Just describe, tell you the logic and then we're done. Okay. Great. So Again, as I said, these are combined in 
let me reduce the image size to 0 0.5 so we're not pushing it too much. Okay, great. So these are combined in um, every layer, but not in, you know, between images. I can go uh, lesser with the, um, like how fat the points are. Make this 12. Okay, we can smooth it out or we can union and smooth it out. Come on, do it. Okay, this is giving an error now because probably our points are too large. Let's go with this one would, for now. Owner, yeah. would you not just flatten the input instead of union? Uh, here, if you do that, yes, but I didn't want to do it for, for a reason. It's, it's exactly, it's true, right? So if I close this, what, uh, who is this? Sorry, I can't see your name. Uh, it's Oscar. Okay. It's Oscar, so, uh, yeah. Oscar, yeah, Oscar. So what Oscar is saying is, okay, you have these points, which are the data is kind of like clustered with one, two, three, four, five, six, instead of doing that, just flatten this, which is true, and then get this unified form. Absolutely, so you can do that. What I was trying to show is this. So one is this, and the other one was kind of like uh, making the union, but I can't flip that actually. Ah, uh, this is not gonna do it. Anyway, let's keep it that way for now. And then we have the smooth, and then I will get back to the flattened version, which is creating the same thing with the union version actually, more or less. Okay. so. The next step is what you create here is um, a volume, technically, it's not a mesh. So in Dendro, you have to go from this volume to mesh component, which is this guy. So it, it essentially converts that into a mesh. So here is what we have. Okay, this is one version. And I'm gonna go with what Oscar suggested. So I'm gonna delete that because my union here didn't work for the, these parameters, which is fine. So I'm gonna close that. And here I'm gonna flatten that. Okay, so I have, okay, this crude mesh. I'm smooth a little bit, make a mesh. So if I bake this, you can see the edges. Okay, so here is one thing. Uh, you still see there are kind of like floating meshes inside this. So if you want to get rid of them, you still need to do the union and uh, smoothen it. And this will hopefully help you get rid of, well, you didn't. Probably it's open because of the resolution and probably because it's 240 PM, right? So nothing's gonna work after this time. Anyway. Okay, so let's, let's, let's simplify things. So I'm gonna flatten, smooth, made the mesh, great. Uh, and then, okay, so here at the step, I explode the mesh. This mesh has, if you look at the F information, faces, 6,030 meshes, faces. So I explode them. And then I also get the face uh, centers, all right? So for each mesh face here I'm having, I'm finding the center points. And then between that point, those points and these points I have, because remember, these points are coming from Hedgehog. And all of those have the color information. I can uh, pair, you know, the points I have here with the color information. You all remember that? So now what I'm doing is I'm looking the closest point in this collection from which I know the colors of each and every point, right? So. I'm looking, searching from these points. I pick a point here and look for the closest point with the color information. And then I, and then I pick that, the, you know, after the search, I pick the index number of that point that I found from this crowd. And then instead of picking that point itself, I'm pulling the color information here, which is the data, I call it data. So it's just the color information. So this is essentially what this is doing is, let me just mark that and let me include this too. So what this is doing essentially is go to the mesh, find mesh faces, find mesh centers. For the each mesh center, please find the closest point with the color data so I can pull it from hedgehog. That's it. 
And then I use the mesh color components and that is creating me this interesting, you know, uh, let's say this uh, representation. And the nice thing now is this is not unified even if you join the mesh. So I flatten it and join it again. We can bake this. So it's a very lightweight mesh, super lightweight, super speedy to use. But at the same time, it has uh, the color info. Okay, so if you render this, uh, it's going to, uh, you know, uh, you can return, actually you can attribute materials to this too by using uh, materials, custom materials in Rhino. So now what you can do is uh, we can go back and we can bump the size. You can save the file first. If it crashes, so hopefully this is we're going to conclude with this save session. Wonderful, and then we're going to go to one. This is going to make it larger. Actually, it's like four times larger now, so it's going to take a while for it to compute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for not crashing. And then we have let's create another layer. Hide this one. And see the you know because we went higher, bigger size, and kept the resolution of the voxels the same. It it gave me something uh, you know with higher definition and so on and so forth. Actually, a couple of nice things you can do here is um, I can okay. So what you can do is the smoothing here. You have how many times you want to smooth it. So instead of one, you can make three iterations which is gonna really push the smoothing on this thing and you know, help, help the computer crash faster. Uh, but you, know, you, you get a final result. And the last, the, the last parameter that I'm gonna show is adaptivity. Adaptivity means if you increase the adaptivity, you will get larger and larger patches of triangles and quads in meshes. If you push it towards zero, it will try to create each voxel as a you know, separate, let's say entity. So let's push this a little bit, 0 0.08. So I'm pushing it to create actually more. I'm, I'm saying don't adapt to the curvature of the surface, no matter what, try to produce voxels that are similar to the size I picked. So essentially what you're gonna get is, if we bake this, you will see, and wireframe shaded, and you're going to get kind of like finer and finer, and you can keep pushing this. And yeah, it kind of looks interesting, uh, you know. So you can make spaceships and uh, render them and play with them, or you can tell a story about you know this video. Uh, let's use um, the V-ray sectioning tool, which is oh here. So if I do this. Okay, so you can do this. So these are exactly the images, right? So this is the interpolation that Diego created or that I created in the you know After Effects. So that that is the when we go like this, the, the each of these are the interpolation that is happening uh, between those uh, those frames. So it's I mean to me it's kind of like it's an interesting way to understand the objects, the world, the time the visualizations that we deal with, right? So instead of just saying, oh, like I took frames, photos and make, make a video, you say, hey, this is a video and it's a solid object in space. And I can, I can make an interpolation by using volumetric uh, voxelization and computational design. So with that, I'm gonna stop here uh, and take, if you have any questions about this one or in general, you know, we'll be, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I have a quick question. Do you mind showing us how you created an animation in your last example again? Uh, sure. So um, are you asking the data flux video that Diego showed or are you asking about the dancing? Uh, the video? dancing thing, the sorry. Dancing. Okay, yeah, I that's know. fine. So what you need what you need to do is it's similar to um, you know what Dana showed. So mm -hmm. if you take Dana's file, instead of feeding one image, you feed five images. So try that. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it's exactly that. 
right? So, and I showed you how to graph things. Instead of using one image, I said you can graph and stack four images. So yeah. in this case, you are going to run it first, run it for the second image, run it for the third image from within a script and just, you know, capture it. That's it. So you get the video. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, do you apply this in any way when you actually design choose? Or Good how? Question. Uh, sure. I mean, you know, I, I did a lot of like image processing uh, at some point while I was working with choose. Mm, for any, uh, to be honest, like for, for creative purposes, be, we don't have any, um, any defined like, you know, uh preset or limited exploration method so anything you see here could be yes explored for shoes i didn't necessarily, necessarily use this temporal thing for the for the shoes that was from actually i have a paper on this so it was my a portion of my phd dissertation uh but a couple of things we did with dana was like for instance we did a 3d printed woven shoe concept so you literally have like woven strings, strands like this, and it's supposed to be 3D printed, right? So that was one of the interesting, I think, meshing, you know, uh, studies that we did. And we usually show that concept like publicly. So uh, I'm okay to share it. I, I, if I Google, I think probably I'm gonna find it anyway. Uh, yeah, that's it. But otherwise, so one thing we do, of course, is, uh, you know, we work with athlete data. And that again, like we have some of the, that information publicly available. and. The athlete data is processed in different ways. Uh, computational designers like us, we, you know, we can go to, you can, we can use like hard numbers, exercises and so on. But if we, if we implement a method for designers to use, let's say in Grasshopper, uh, we usually convert things to, into images or sports research lab already, you know, it's so like, it's a humongous amount of data. So they go over it, they clean it a little bit, and then, you know, they pass us images already. So, and it's interesting because running is also a very temporal thing, right? So it depends on the time. And once you look into, let's say, a pressure data, you see like somebody landing on the ground with the heel strike and kind of like taking off, you know, like you see how the pressure moves on their foot from like back to the front, depending on how you, how you land. Some people land on four foot and so on and so forth, right? So, so the, I mean, the, you know, the, the understanding is already there. So we look into those things and we try to come up with new representations and new ways to understand the data. Yeah, because it's, in a way, it reminds me very much of, there's, I think there's a lot of commercials for shoes which are made in Houdini. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, it, like, it gives a similar kind of expression, but it's obviously so. very generative and maybe it's less AI and more, parametric design i don't know but it's yeah yeah i think i think this is definitely like i think this workshop is kind of like hitting some interesting sweet spots uh, depending on where we are at because to be honest making this in houdini would be much faster and all the methods you see here are our own implementations right so everything you see here is kind of like uh most of it you know like some meshing i came up with some of that Dana came up with, you know, and so on and so forth. So Diego has been looking into M uh, machine learning, uh, the AI stuff and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, I think it's a, it's a knowledge that's not gained, but it's developed is quite interesting for us. And the, the, the good thing is, I think we are like in full control of things here. So we have also like custom components and, you know, scripts and so on and so forth. It is like super, like crystal clear to to us, right? So when we are kind of trying to use this for making something, so we can definitely speak and talk about it instead of saying, "Oh, you know, somebody wrote this in plugin and this and probably is doing that." So it's not really like that. And I really love, uh, you know, to your point, I think the Houdini uh, uh, advertisements that we see they're super impressive. They're so cool. Uh, but again, I think it, that's more like the visual expression of things, which we did in this workshop, right? So we produced fake data and we played with it, which is fine. Uh, but I think one crucial thing is again, like how you bridge like real data to real application is a kind of like a weird question. Uh, and yeah. again, I think it helps like breaking down the problem, really helps. Great, great, great question. Thanks, man.
anything else yet? Oscar just sent the video. Um, let me see. Yeah, that no, was I just a reference to my Houdini yeah. comment. Yeah, yeah, I know this. That's great. I know this video. You know what? To be honest, like I wanted to get my hands on Houdini for a long time. I tried it, but I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I, I don't know. That that was that never became the super priority uh, for me. I guess Blender will take over soon, Houdini, <laughs> with 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 a, with a new node uh, yeah. implementation. Well, and, yeah, for, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, this is cool. it's in it, the strength of the physics engine that they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for Houdini. Yes, I agree. That's crazy. And I, I watched this video before, uh, just so you know, Oscar. So thanks for sending it. I think it's a very, very cool video. I love that. And he made the, the guy is pretty, pretty crazy. Yes, he did a very nice job. Anything else? The, uh, okay, so our goal would be to, you know, like send you and get you back by this time, but I think as usual, what we do is we always like go super uh, ambitious to to share as much as we can, right? Because like we take you from zero to, we don't want to leave you at like 30, 35. We want you to hit high, you know, highway speeds and on like 60, 70 miles per hour. So we want to kind of like share all that information with you. Uh, and I think it would be really great if you're interested in, you know, getting in touch with us again, just, just simple, even even as simple as like putting your own image and showing us what happens. That's our price, okay? So if you do that, we will be really happy. Uh, beyond that, again, like you know, we can we can keep asking questions for a while. If you if you have any more questions or comments, like Oscar did, I think it's super valid point. Great. Any any final remarks from uh, Dana? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think this is, there's a lot of content here and I think I'm most, I'm most interested in like different interpretations of how you can use the tools. And so I think um, there's a lot of room for creativity and play and i um, excited to see like things keep popping up daily with new tools like D what Diego showed. I, I haven't seen. So it's like really, really cool to just keep gathering all these new tools and, and seeing what you can do with them. So I'd love to keep in touch. Diego? Also, I think it's very interesting. I mean, you see like a lot of explorations like everywhere now with stable diffusion or like people or, or like you know, DALI or Mid Journey. I think uh, on my side, what I think is fascinating is how do you take what it's like uh, frozen on the screen and you make it active uh, because when you talk about creativity it's, it's about the process, it's about like massaging what you have and it's about like creating new things, uh, crashing your grasshopper or crashing whatever you're using uh, because I think in, 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 in my case I think that's where the creativity is. is. The, the generating an image is just like the, the, the start point. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And then you can do whatever whatever you want. Any any feedback? Any comments from the uh, participants about any 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 of the subject? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a it's so many things to go over, and so many tools. Uh, thank you so much, all, all three of you. Thank you. Probably yeah, you're gonna, yeah, yeah go ahead. Sorry. Yes. It's just amazing how much I learned within only like five hours today. So I just cannot say thank you that more. Was the goal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I knew nothing about all these things and I learned so many things. So thank you so much, all three of you. That's great. So we, we will keep those files available. Uh, we will upload the latest ones. And uh, I will get this recording from, um, you know, the team uh, and core team. And then I am thinking of like, you know, going over it and probably publishing on YouTube too. So you can go back and refer to it. If you, if you agree, if you don't agree, I can 
blur your faces and you know like do, do stuff like that too if you don't mind we can just publish it and probably hundreds of other people can you know benefit from this conversation too and i think that's the way to go just making because what imagine today you know we pay we start with like paid subscription local running and finally we use an open source so it's really important to you know make these kind of things uh, available for others so people can keep pushing things so uh, you know we use an open source and we can make this conversation an open source as well i have a uh, very small question i um mm -hmm. when maybe you mentioned it like when you talk about uh, data data on mm -hmm. buildings for example mm -hmm. this for 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 you like this kind of uh, color differentiation it's time it may mean something else like the heat maps and yeah, I think, you know, okay, so one conversation was uh, in beginning of 2000s and around 2005, uh, people starting like artificial companies started producing a lot of, you know, like heat map uh, descriptions, visualizations of buildings, and it kind of became almost a selling point, okay, so it's like, oh, we ran, you know, uh, simulations on this, and it's getting this much of light and, you know, shade and so on and so forth, so essentially, it was just a heat map, and I, I've been using uh, actually like in architecture, I used a lot of like color descriptions showing the curvature of, you know, complex skyscrapers or, you know, how much you torque a beam in construction. And actually who is from Arab today? Okay, so let me show you something. Well. You're gonna like this one. Um, uh, Riverside 6.6. Six. This is for you coming. All right. So I worked on this project in 2000 and 2007 or eight uh, with Jeff Kenoff at KPF. There was somebody from KPF. She left, I guess, but anyway, so, okay. Uh, so this building uh, is a KPF design and I, I, was, I was really happy to, to work on that, but it's super complicated. What's happening here is that there are ribs here and then it's their elliptical, but their scale change, their height change, and their position change, and like everything is changing. And then the client wanted these beams, these horizontal beams, to be parallel to the ground. Well, you know, and then this went to Arab engineers, right? So then it's, it wasn't 100% resolved, and it came back to me. I, I wasn't working on the design. So I had to prove, showcase that, if you want to have these parallel to the ground, because everything is pulling, you cannot have flat beams, right? So you have to either torque it, bend it, or both. And of course, you know, the client doesn't want to do that because it's expensive to do so. And finally, I did some sort of like color visualization showing uh, that geometry doesn't exist. Okay. So like having flat beams. And you know, uh, doing that doesn't exist. So if I can find that image, you know, I can show that really fast. So no, months. Let me see. Uh, maybe here. Okay. Yes, I'm gonna find it here in a second. So essentially, yes, colors to to cut to the chase. Colors mean a lot, uh, and. But as long as you know you attribute some sort of meaning meaning to them, and that meaning is very flexible. So okay, here is the building. Here are those ribs. This is, by the way, okay. So this is the first one of the first grasshopper files that I was dealing with really early, and grasshopper was unable to handle this because it wasn't able to deal with uh, double arrays. So it wasn't it was unable to you couldn't do nested arrays. So I had to come up with a way to use like nested arrays in grasshopper and here you see the colors, right? So this is these are showing the torques, how much the beam has to be torqued to, to build that building. And this is showing how much discrepancy there are between the two ends of the mm, a beam. So see, this is going to this line and that is going to that line. And sorry, this is going to this line and they are not matching. So even uh, the difference is extreme here. See, this is going up. This is more horizontal, so the beam has to be like that torque. Okay, so that's the that was the way to describe this. This was, for instance, I'm using color here just to explain. This was before me. This is after me. Right, touching. This is 2006. 
me working on a finished design, trying to optimize it and coming up with different examples. I have a chapter in this elements of parametric design with Robert Woodbury, if you want to read about these uh, examples. So this is, for instance, color coding the panels and trying to group them uh, depending on the tolerance. And this is a fairly complex surface too. Uh, so just using color in that respect. And then, you know, this is a more like a making the colors represent and making the colors like this is like a representation that both humans and machine can read, right? So this is a common language showing, this is my sketch that I was trying to come up with this language. And then I was converting it into some sort of like machine readable, you know, language in an Excel sheet. Colors everywhere. So I'm going to stop right there. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that was, that was exactly to work with Arab too at the time. It's cool. All right. Um, with that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> what is the name, name of the book that you had a chapter in? Uh, this, is, this is Tangent Ribbon Side 66. The nice thing is, we also won an award. So I, I, I left KPF at some point, but then I heard, you know, we won the uh, New York uh, AIA uh, award for unbuilt monuments, uh, unbuilt uh, large buildings or something like that. So we won an award with this building before it was built. That's the interesting thing because it's an unbuilt building. <laughs> and then once it was built, it was the longest landscaper in Asia at some point. So it was the longest, like this single, you know, space building. Uh, and I just put the, put the link for that. And actually, JP has, has a nice space on it, on, on it too. So let's do that. Thank you. Sure. No problem. Great. Thanks all. Keep in touch. You have our emails because I email everyone. Uh, you know, feel free to ask questions and, you know, we'll be happy to respond as much as we can. And we'll see you next time, hopefully somewhere. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.